All right, welcome to the uh, second night of four nights of budget hearings uh, for the city of Bloomington. Today is August 30th, 2022. On tonight's agenda, we'll hear from In Order, Bloomington Transit with uh, General Manager John Connell, City of Bloomington Utilities, Director Vic Kelson, and he will be remote tonight. S uh, Bloomington Fire Department with uh, Chief Jason Moore. He will also be remote tonight. And then uh, the last of four it will be the City of Bloomington Police Department with Chief Mike Dekoff presenting. In order to move through our agenda, um, I believe we have agreed. Do we need to vote again on limiting debate? No, I believe last night's motion applies throughout this week's okay, meeting. Okay, thank you. So, uh, council members will have three minutes for a, for questions after presentation. Um, when we go to for each round of questions, and then uh, when we go to the public, public will have two minutes um, to um, comment on the items that are uh, under uh, discussion. The the department. Um, then will we return to council for a final comment? After completing that discussion, uh, we will entertain a due pass recommendation, and a due pass is not a, a binding vote. It's to show support or not support or pass on on the on the budget that is being presented. Um, okay, so let's proceed. Um, tonight we'll begin with. Bloomington Transit and General Manager John Connell, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, John Connell, General Manager of Bloomington Transit. With me tonight is Krista Browning, our controller. Uh, between the two of us, hopefully we can answer any questions you may have. Uh, oh, sorry. Actually, I'm really sorry. Um, Chairman Smith, I think we actually need to call roll for tonight's meeting. Pardon me. That's fine. So sorry. Should have caught that Deputy earlier. Clerk, would you like to call a roll? Yes. And if I can get back to my screen here. Sorry, Mr. Right. Connell. That's fine. So sorry. Um, Councilmember Rosenberger? Here. Councilmember Bolin? Here. Okay. Yeah. Sims? Here. Scambolieri? Here. Sandberg? Here. Rollo? Here. Flaherty? Smith? Here. And Piedmont Smith? Here. Thank you. All right. Sorry for that brief interruption. You're oh, that's, on. that's fine. Thank you. Uh, just to, you know, as most of you know, Bloomington Public Transportation is a separate municipal corporation, and it is, it has five board members, board directors, uh, three of which are appointed by this council and two by the mayor. Uh, we do have our own taxing authority and the BT board has reviewed and endorsed this budget that I'll be presenting tonight. Uh, just to kind of recap of where we are currently, the city council's annual dedication of the $3.8 million in lit funding is a game changer for transit. It position, positions BT not only to become one of the best transit systems in the state, but I think it could become one of the best in the country. The commitment of local funds have, has already paid big dividends. And I think this really provides us an opportunity to transform mobility in our community. Talk about some of the accomplishments to date. Our alternative fuel and infrastructure assessment study was completed earlier this year. We looked at three alternative fuel sources, compressed natural gas, battery electric, and hydrogen fuel cell technology. We compared, looked at the capital costs, operating costs, and maintenance costs, and obviously we looked at the environmental impact of all three. The results of the study led to a recommendation to transition the Bloomington Transit Fleet to battery, battery electric. Last week, the board of the Bloomington Transit passed a resolution 
establishing a goal to transition 60% of the fleet to battery electric by 2030. The $1.7 million in lit funds that we identified in our grant application as a commitment for local funding, I think was pivotal in the 5339 grant application being approved. So it yielded over $7 million in federal funding. And we'll use that for eight battery electric buses for expansion purposes. Some other noteworthy accomplishments this year, the ratification of a new four-year collective bargaining agreement. The CBA establishes competitive pay rates, improves some scheduling procedures, and put, positions us to be competitive in the commercial driving market. We also introduced successfully a microtransit pilot program. We've expanded that. There's two components. One is known as BT Late Night. It's available 9 to midnight, Monday through Friday. And then we just launched what we, we call BT Eastside On Demand. And that provides a safety net for individuals who may have been negatively impacted by the, the elimination of the number eight route. We've established partnerships with property, develop, the property developers for delivering enhanced public transportation. We currently have partnerships with the property developer uh, known as the Atlas on 17th and the Verve on North Walnut. We've, we've also implemented some service changes that were recommended in the route optimization study. A couple other things I want to talk about that I think are very important. Uh, we held two corporate training sessions in 2022. We recognize our employees are our greatest asset, and we want to provide opportunities for professional development. Not only do we feel this is an employer's duty, but we know it improves morale and promotes career satisfaction. These sessions specialized, provided specialized training, not only in transit, but provided an opportunity for all of our employees to hear firsthand of the new projects that are in the works and offer their ideas, suggestions, questions, and concerns. Another big project that's currently underway is our strategic plan. We are in the process of developing a new strategic plan. The strategic plan is a roadmap for BT. What will BT look like in three years, five years, 10 years? We're reimagining our vision, our mission, and our goals. We want to reinvent public transportation post-pandemic. The pandemic has changed a lot of things, people's travel patterns, and we recognize that. We want to improve accessibility. We want public transportation to be available to all of our residents. We're going to continue to look at new service options. And while we do all that, we want to acknowledge our, environment, our, our environmental and financial stewardship, that we need to be good stewards of not only the environment, but of the public resources. Talk a little bit about our ridership, it's slowly rebounding. 2022 fixed route ridership is up 88%. Sounds fantastic, but it's still a long way to go from where we were pre-pandemic. We're forecasting 1.8 million passenger trips for 2022, and we hope those two new routes that I mentioned will drive ridership in that direction. Kind of transition here and talk about our 2023 20, budget goals in terms of climate change and the environment. We plan to order 16 new electric buses and charging equipment. We want to initiate the process of developing rapid transit service here in Bloomington. The starting point would be phase one, a feasibility study. Depending on the results of that study, we would move immediately into phase two corridor analysis. In addition to the microtransit we're currently offering, we'd want to implement a hybrid approach. 
That would be a situation where we would continue to contract with TNCs like Uber and Lyft, but we'd also provide in-house services with BT employees and B BT vehicles. We plan to improve fixed route frequency, and we want to add Sunday service. As far as equity and inclusion, a couple projects that we have included in the 2023 budget, new fare collection equipment and technology. This will allow us to ensure that fares are paid equitably. So for example, under the current system, if you have the financial wherewithal to buy a monthly pass, you do that the first of the month, it costs you $30. If you don't have the financial capacity, then you pay your $2. Let's say you're a regular rider, you ride every day two trips. By day 15, you've paid $30. So 16 through the 30th, you're overpaying what I possibly could pay with my monthly pass. So we want to look at technology to address those type of concerns. We also want to continue the evolution of the on-demand mobility pilot program. There's barriers that prevent people from using our service. We recognize that. One of them is geographic. They may, they may just live too far from a fixed route. We want to address that through a micro transit mobility approach. Here's a breakdown of the 2023 budget compared to the 2022. Kristen and I were talking about this earlier before coming over. You know, this really isn't an apples to apples comparison given the infusion of the additional federal money and the local lit that's been a game changer. But nonetheless, I'll walk you through the four components. You know, an 8.8% .8 increase in personnel, uh, that's wage increases and additional positions that we've added to the budget. Materials and supplies, pretty significant increase. Like everybody else, we've seen an increase in the inflation of costs uh, to bus parts, and obviously fuel is a big component. Uh, services, this includes those studies that I mentioned earlier. And then the capital of that $23 million in this budget, 17.7 .7 is federal funding. So if you recall, I think it, well, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago when I was here when we were talking about the ED lit projects, these were the five that were identified as worthwhile to fund. This council saw that these projects were worthwhile to provide funding to see them happen. And these are the dollar amounts that were associated with each project. This next slide I would like to demonstrate what this budget includes in terms of ED lit project expenses. So the rapid transit studies, they're funded in this budget. A grant procurement specialist position. We feel it's important to fund this position because as we pursue rapid transit and some of these other aggressive enhancements, we want to have a person in place to pursue every federal dollar that we can. Currently, we have the bandwidth to submit one to two federal grant applications a year to be due in four or five. We need, a new, we need an additional person, and that's why that position's in here. Same with the position of manager of marketing and development. We can implement and launch all these new services if we don't do a good job of marketing and developing those services, they're destined to fail. The local share, oh, I'm sorry. The facility expansion and land acquisition, as we grow the fleet and we add services, the Grimes Lane facility, we are busting at the seams. So we need to start exploring our options, whether it be pursuing, purchasing additional parcels, uh, 
there's, there's a variety of options that were identified in our infrastructure study results. Uh, we need the professional expertise to help us navigate through that process. Not only the valuation, uh, but the environmental issues that come with purchasing additional property. Mentioned the, the local share for the eight electric buses. We also have $1.2 million in this budget for a, an additional six electric buses. That is just local match. We want to have that money in the budget so come 2023, when we apply again for 5339 funds, we can demonstrate the money is there, the local commitment exists, and strengthen our chances to uh, receive more federal money. The CAD EVO operating platform and hardware, this is the software and hardware necessary to launch microtransit in-house. And in addition to the operating platform, we would need the vehicles. We would continue, as I mentioned, to contract with TNCs to supplement that service. Uh, we plan on launching Sunday service, first quarter of 2023. And then we have the $93,000 budgeted for a fair subsidy program. Take you through the revenue. Our tax base is 2.2 million. Our fares, which include cash fares, our contracts, this includes the IU contract. We have the ED lit that this council has dedicated to Bloomington Transit. The Public Mass Transportation Fund, administered through the state and then miscellaneous, and then uh, we are using 3.5 million in BT cash reserves in this budget. So the projects that were identified by the council as worthy of lit funding, our board has also re recognized them as worthy and, are, and, and is willing to obligate $3.5 million in cash reserves to see them succeed. Challenges for 2022 and beyond. Currently, the, the labor market is tight. We are continuing to struggle to hire additional bus operators. I'm happy to report it's gotten better. Uh, we have three trainees in the process currently. We have two more that will start our training program Monday. So things are, are getting better, but we could still use an additional eight. So it continues to be an issue. The ridership recovery. Things are starting to, to trend back to what we would see on campus during the pre-pandemic days. We have buses that are, are filling up and we are providing supplemental service because of capacity issues, which is very encouraging. But it's going to be a continued battle, continue, continually to battle to recover that lost ridership. The expansion of the Grimes Lane facility and property, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be a big challenge for us. And that's something that we're going to have to address immediately. And lastly, change management. These projects, as grateful as we are for the lit funding, this is coming at us at lightning speed. And from me all the way down to individuals washing buses. You know, it's, it's big changes coming to Bloomington Transit, and we want to navigate those changes in a productive fashion where all our employees feel like they're part of the process. So that is going to be a big challenge when you, anytime you introduce new technology. Uh, so we, we recognize that as an opportunity for us to take BT in a new direction. So with that, I will thank you for your consideration and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Connell, General Manager Connell. Um, and so we'll go to uh, questions from council members and I'm gonna look to my left, uh, Mr. Rallo. Go ahead, you have three minutes. 
Thank you, Chair Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connell. Uh, I have a lot in no particular order. So let's talk about the battery buses. Uh, th this is full electric. Is that uh, correct? The battery bus? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, are they more expensive than conventional? Yes. Do they require more maintenance in terms of challenges and things no. like that as well? They don't? Not in terms of routine maintenance. They're, but their longevity? Uh, longevity is yet to be determined. Okay. So, so it's sort of experimental at this point. There is a learning curve in terms of uh, working on the vehicles, but as far as, you know, there's no oil changes, you know, things of that nature. It's a simpler motor, yes. right, engine. Um, so w what's the potential for recharging with solar? So on our infrastructure study results, they do show a, a, a design where rooftop solar panels are used to supplement your electricity needs. It's not going to, you know, work out to charge a bus, but it could supplement. Okay. All right. I'd be interested in maybe to what degree. Okay. Wouldn't it be nice okay. if we could be self-sufficient? Um, may I continue Please with my time? Question. Okay. So raising wages, by what increment? Are, is that 8.8% uh, wage for base? For 2023, it works out to a 5% increase. That's 5 General 5%. Now, there are classifications that will receive significantly more, maybe in maintenance. Um, but when we were bargaining, we looked at what our peers are paying. Mm -hmm. And the first year, there was a significant bump uh, to bring the, st the starting pay. Okay. Uh, but what we're looking at is generally a 5% increase. All right. Um, so the project expenses slide indicates studies for $450,000 for um, rapid transit, I believe. Yes. Is that right? Um, that's quite a sum. Are those multiple studies? Uh, I, sorry. Multiple studies? Does this There's two entail? Yes, two studies. Two studies. So phase one would be the general feasibility analysis, determining, looking at the market conditions, the population, yeah. is this something that would work in this community? Is it feasible? Yeah. Um, and this is, you contract with a consultant? Yes, for we that? would. Okay. And... The cash reserves, will those be replenished, the $3.5 million that you're utilizing this year? Would, is that something that you expect to be to be replenished over time, or is this uh, like a one-off? No. We, no? Were, we, had, we were sitting on $10 million in cash reserves. So at some point, uh, you know, we want to obviously have mm -hmm. s significant cash reserves in place, but like I said, the infusion of the lit money was a game changer. Like, you know, demonstrates that we have skin in the game, so to speak. Okay. So you got six six point five million remaining in cash reserves. Thank you. My time's up. So appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh Councilmember Piedmont Smith, please. Oh, I won't forget you. I won't forget you, Councilmember Volan. Thank you. Um I wanted to get back to the uh, budget uh, class one um, compensation. Um, so I'm, I'm a little confused as to how it's broken down uh, between salaries for operators, salaries for other operating, uh, you know, supervisors and administrative. Um, because it looks like in the operators, that line went down by half, half a percent. and. In the administrative category, it went up by 41 and a half percent. So, could you explain that a little? Yes. So, the 2022 amount was over budgeted significantly because of the uncertainty of going into contract negotiation and everything that was going on. So, it was it was bloated. That's a um, so the uncertainty of not knowing how the negotiations were going to turn out and. So it was significantly over budgeted in 2022, for whatever reason. I, you know. And then the um, the large increase in the administrative or the salaries, uh, other operating category. Yes. So we have a chief safety officer position that's being added this year, 
Federal Transit Administration has a requirement that we have in place a safety plan, and we do. Uh, but in order to bring that plan to life, we need a person to oversee it uh, with the expertise. The road supervisor position was added to this budget, which is a, a management position. The road supervisors provide assistance to bus operators when they're you know, in difficult situations. They're out there in the field to provide assistance when needed. We felt that was important. And is there anyone else I'm missing? No, those would be the two additional positions. Thank you. Um, I have one other question. Oh yeah, so I'm looking at your revenues breakdown and for passenger fares, uh, you have a 139% increase expected in revenues. And can you, is this just your expected pickup from post pandemic or? No, that is, is driven that? by the two service contract partnerships we developed with the two property owners, the Verve and Atlas. Okay, I see. Um, okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Council Member Volan. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentation, Mr. Connell. Um, first question is uh, about the electric buses. Uh, my understanding over the years has been that we've been reluctant to add them because of the underpass at 10th Street. Is there some movement on that front? Not that I'm aware of, unfortunately. So where are those buses going to run if they don't fit under the underpass? Well, we like we we have in the past, we will modify routes if necessary. So it is definitely I mean, a I challenge. Know they're talking definitely Sorry, a challenge. Ahead. Well, I know they're talking about and. Uh, uh, Jason Bannock of IU told me at the last MPO that uh, they apparently are actively considering uh, extending Law Lane so that the bus can uh, bypass the uh, underpass altogether. A any news on that per from your end? No, I, I, I've heard that as well, but uh, I have not heard a, a definite timeline, but that would be fantastic if that actually pans out. So basically you're saying that the new buses would all go to routes that don't uh, deal with that underpass? Or we would modify existing routes to uh, accommodate, you know, it is, it is definitely gonna be a challenge. Um, so yeah, that's obviously something we're gonna have to consider. Mr. Griffin seems to have an answer yeah. for you. Well, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Hey, hey uh, 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 Council Member uh, Volan, um, I have been in Mayor. <laughs> I have been been in discussions with uh, um, IU in regards IU and IU Health in regards to uh, looking at the uh, extension of Law Lane. So we've been talking about it and trying to figure that out, but it is something that we are talking <clears throat> about to get uh, to get some of the. Uh, traffic off of 10th Street, uh, provide easier access to IU Health, and to also help us with uh, getting our electric and hybrid buses uh, further east, so. Okay, well, I mean, I'm looking forward to it, I, and I know that'll make his job easier, so. Um, other question is, um, I, I had trouble finding uh, the fares uh, the, the breakdown of fares uh, from your slide, but I found it here. Um, is there a reason that you didn't include, like all the other budgets did, the three prior years of actual? Because uh, right now you only have 2022 and 2023, but and I know that uh, the pandemic was unusual, but being able to see 2019's year can give us a sense of uh, the real dramatic uh, uh, change in normal services. Well, I, we could we could provide that to you. That'd be great. Okay. Well, we can talk about it later. But All thank right. you. Thank you very much. Um, to my right, uh, Council Member Sims. Thank you, Mr. Connell, for the report. Um, you talked about cash reserves and that you were down to six and a half million now. 
or it'll, it'll at, be. as part of the budget. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, and I guess my question is, what do you and the board, what is your minimum amount that you guys strive to maintain? Or, or is there such a number? Yes, it's uh, six months. Six months uh, to keep us operating for six months is what we established as okay. the minimum standard. And we what, need to be there. what is that amount? Uh, Four million. Okay, thank you. Um, and you talked about Sunday service. Can you give us an idea of what that could look like? Well, we would look at uh, what the budget includes is 56 hours of additional fixed route service. Obviously, we would look at uh, providing service on the most frequently traveled routes. Uh, there might be, after a, a few months of service, you might look to in introduce a microtransit component to it as well. Um, but the goal is to get people where they need to go on Sundays. Okay, good. I'm glad to see that consideration. We've had those conversations. Yes. So. I'll be interested in seeing that. And my last question is, um, you talked about facility expansion and land acquisition services, a yes. uh, quarter million dollars. I guess my first question is that, does that include a new position or no. do you do that in house? No, that would be to identify parcels that would be um, attractive to, to acquire and then do the environmental analysis before that, that's required before we can apply for any federal money to purchase those type of properties. So it's doing our due diligence to have everything lined up, and when we pull the trigger, we want to be able to leverage some federal money if it's available. Okay, so there is an anticipation it will take more funds. To, to, uh, to, to, yeah, to, that, yeah, that okay. to, to who 50 is just to yeah, okay. I, I was work to that. figure out what, what where what are our options? We have a pretty good idea, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, good. And I was thinking that don't appear to be enough, and particularly within city. So, okay. um, all right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Rosenberger. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I wanted to ask about the rapid transit. Is the feasibility study scheduled then, or are you planning on funding that in 2023? So what we have budgeted is phase one to be under contract in first quarter of 2023, and we hope to have a contract for phase two, if everything plays in that direction, last quarter of 2023. So the results of phase two would probably come, most likely come in 2024. Okay. All right, and okay. then phase two is gonna be a lot more elaborate than phase one because you start really getting into the weeds and we want to work closely with the city to identify areas, corridors that will be beneficial to the community. And is, does that study work, um, is it looking at the streets as they are now or does it take into consideration that streets can be changed? Both. Okay. That's, that's the plan. Okay. And uh, that's why the coordination with the city is critical. That's really, that's really cool. Um, and then I just wanted to ask about um, something we've talked about up here before, some kind of ridership survey. Do we do anything with our current riders to, you know, pull, to get yes. a pulse on what they're wanting? And yes, we do customer satisfaction surveying. We do, uh, prior to launching the BT late night microtransit program, we did some surveying of those individuals using the service in the evening hours. Um, so yes, we do. Uh, one of the interesting things about the strategic plan is we feel it's important, you know, not only to survey our customers, but we want to survey the people that are not riding the bus, mm -hmm. find out why not. I think that makes a lot of sense. Do, do we have access to that information or is, is any of it anything you could share with us at times? Yes, all of it. Okay. So it's, it's in the works. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Skimbalouri. Yes, thank you for the report. Uh, thank you for sharing the good news of the seven million in federal funding too. That's very exciting. Like a team uh, effort. And I'm always pleased to see. Uh, I'm, of course, we want to spend our own money responsibly, but it's nice to see other people putting money into our community. Um, what would allow us to be more competitive? It sounds as if we're 
reasonably successful now in, in getting the grants that we pursue, uh, is there anything that would make us even more competitive? Yeah, so the, so the evaluation criteria vary from uh, project to project or funding source, but typically, you know, the, the need, the technical uh, experience to see it through. So when, when we applied for the 5339, funds this last go around all the pieces of the puzzle were falling into place we just completed our alternative fuel infrastructure study we had the results we had a transition plan we had experience with two electric buses we had the commitment of the local funding required so they want to make sure we get we provide you these federal resources you're going to use them and use them asap and so th those are some of the criteria. So as, as, if you demonstrate, and that's why this grant position is in this budget. Uh, if you review the memorandum I submitted to each of you, there was a detail uh, uh, in terms of when we looked at the project for the East-West Rapid Transit, I kept referring to, uh, we want it consistent with the FTA definition so we want to pursue those federal funds in those programs like the new starts. So all the study, we want to have everything, you know, packaged together, all those pieces of the puzzle fall into place when we make the application. And will that fall under, will that responsibility fall under the purview of the new position? Um, yes, that's, that's our, our goal. And is there a particular, I, I guess I'm, my, I'm a fundraiser, so I ask these questions, but um, are there ways we will evaluate that person's success? Are there expectations of grant success? Are there? Well, we definitely want them to have uh, proficiency in the grant programs. We want them to have some experience writing previous grants, whether they be through the FTA or any other federal agency. Uh, so yeah, we definitely want a seasoned person. Okay, and how are we measuring their success once they're here? Is it dollars in the door or? It seems like well, it would be more nuanced than that. Well, so. we, we, we've joked about that in the past. Uh, uh, Zach, who is our special projects manager, he's been successful. And I said, well, do you want to go to a 1% commission instead? Uh, just kidding. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, there's, you, you do your best. You put together information. You make sure, you know, it, and sometimes it, it, like I said, this, this go around, we had, a, we had a solid application. All the pieces of the puzzle fell together. But there are times when I felt equally, you know, prior to being in Bloomington, equally confident that, oh, this is a slam dunk and you don't get the money. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's competitive. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Great. I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Okay. Um, uh, one question I would like to ask um, I've had a lot of people commenting. They they wonder about how the extension to Ivy Tech fits in to the all the great things you guys are doing because uh, BT Transit is doing a lot of fantastic things. So can you comment on that for us? Well, it's a very difficult, complicated situation, and uh, part of the strategic planning process we're looking at a variety of different issues. One concern we would have as, is a fragmented approach to providing bus service outside of the city and you know, doing it in a piecemeal fashion. I think there needs to be a consensus of the direction Bloomington Transit's gonna go in terms of satisfying those mobility issues. So uh, I'm not you know, trying to dodge the question, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that topic in and of itself, we could meet in, in a different form and it would be one to two hour meeting. Absolutely, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I did want to ask that. That's fine. Uh, several people have brought that up to me. I recently. understand. Thank you very much. Are we okay with uh, council members? Then I can go to the public. Uh, uh, do you have an, one more question, uh, council member Volick? Well, two. yeah, I wanted to follow up on the question you asked, if it's okay. 
Um, Mr. Connell, the, uh, uh, there seems to be pretty universal support for extending service to Daniel's way. Um, are you concerned about requests for other extensions of service or even that one? Well, that's definitely one of the possibilities. Uh, you know, you open that door, it, it may lead to other requests and then you have a piecemeal approach. You know, I know you and I have talked about the marginal increase in the cost of, of doing those type of things, but we like to look at the totality of the network, the fixed route network, and, uh, you know, adding a segment on an existing route may not be the best solution. So if we're going to do anything of that nature, I think it, it like I said, it, it warrants a, um, a lot of discussion. And well, if we were to do it, we want to do it right. I mean, I, I certainly share your concern that uh, such an extension of service is not um, trivial, um, but I'm not sure how else we might have Bloomington Transit Service to Ivy Tech and the like without simply including it as part of Route 3, including it as part of the East-West Rapid Bus Route. So, I mean, like, I don't see any other way to extend service to them. Uh, and, you know, the resolution that I've tabled uh, assumes that any service outside the city will be paid for by the county. I know that the marginal cost is something that you have to determine. But, like, I don't know why that particular question is, I mean, I don't, are you saying that you're worried about other requests besides that one? or are you worried about that one too? No, I think what I'm saying is we are, you know, going through this strategic planning process and that's one of a, a variety of different complicated issues that we're gonna have to na navigate through. As far as the East-West Express Service, that phase two corridor analysis, that will be part of the, the, the conversation at that point. Uh, you know, where does that route start, where does it end, and where does it stop in between? Okay, well, I look forward to that. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Council Member Rowell. Uh, Mr. Connell, one last question I had was about expansion. Is that to another site? Is the whole facility at Grimes going to move, or is this an addition? Like yet, a yet to be determined. We share okay. that facility with IU Campus Bus. Uh, my understanding is campus bus is pursuing other options as well, looking at what's available, what other university properties are available if they were to relocate. So, you know, operating two systems out of that one site, we're getting to a point one of us are, are going to have to either find a new location or we're going to have to purchase additional property, adjoining properties to make it work. I see. And, and with this site, it would it be you know, offices for employees, parking, uh, bus maintenance facilities, fuel. I, yeah. I mean, is, is, does everything come with this new well, site? Well, we're looking at a variety of options. If okay. the Grimes facility becomes the maintenance and operations complex and we move the administrative offices to an uh, off-site location, um, you know, that's one option. You know, we're at parking capacity for our employees. Um, we're at office capacity, the number of office spaces available for, you know, we're going to bring in additional personnel. They're going to be in cubicles. Not ideal, but we'll make it work. But those are big picture concerns that we are exploring right now. I see. So there's a lot to be considered. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you very much. Um, I think now uh, we're ready for public comment. Uh, public may send a chat, send an indication to uh, Mr. Lucas, um, and uh, we'll have two minutes to comment on um, the relevant uh, uh, budget under consideration right now. Mr. Lucas, um, how are you doing over there with the public? Moment, and for any other members of the public that wish to comment <clears throat> on the transit budget, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, to indicate your desire to speak, you can find that raise hand button under the reactions tab or the more tab in your control bar. 
All right, let me start with uh, people in the, uh, in the hall here. If you will uh, identify yourself, and you have two minutes. Good evening, uh, Council. This is Christopher M.G. from the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. I first want to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Connell for the fine work and leadership he's done with Bloomington Transit over this difficult times. As you may recall from the lit debate, uh, the bucket we were supporting uh, the chamber was um, climate change, which specifically went to the expansion of Bloomington Transit. We felt the presentation was very exciting. There's a lot of things I think we can look forward to as transformative and making our community uh, really a, a beacon of others to follow. Um, I do want to say that we look forward to having conversations about that uh, expansion to Ivy Tech on Route 3. We, we feel that as much as it might not be uh, ideal, it is a good first start and uh, something that I think residents' uh, transportation needs uh, would be vastly improved by that access to both that and other employment opportunities. I thank you for your time today and support this budget. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, would you like to uh, um, help us with a uh, person from the public can identify yourself and you will have two minutes to speak on the, the BT budget. Yes, first up is Natalia Galvin. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Galvin. Oh, hello. This is uh, Natalia Galvin. Um, the first time I heard about microtransit was during last year's budget advance. Uh, this year, I have connected community members, especially in under-resourced neighborhoods, with Bloomington Transit and Mr. Connell directly. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Connell for taking community concerns and feedback into account with his budget. I am pleased to see this expansion of microtransit and the addition of microtransit options and possible Sunday service in the budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the hall wish to speak to the BT budget? Anyone else online? Not that I see at the moment. Okay, we will come back to uh, the comment from council members. Um, who would like to go first? You wanna make a final comment? Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I found the report, a uh, presentation, very interesting, thank you. Um, something to look forward to. I do have some thoughts and um, uh, not an attempt to micromanage and I don't even need an answer tonight, but just share my thoughts with you. Um, we talked about the cash reserves um, and you currently have six and a half million, you need four and a half million. Uh, that kind of begs a question, two million dollars. <laughs> Is there any plans that you may have for that? Could that be used as part of the property acquisition? And uh, so just a thought. I mean, I'm not so sure we need an answer for that tonight. Um, you also mentioned earlier about the position of road supervisor, and I didn't catch whether that was a current position or is that a, a new position? We have one currently mm -hmm. uh, in, in, on the budget for this year. We just hired a person. It was budgeted in 2020, this year, 2022, and we're adding a second one. So the idea behind that is we want an AM and a PM. We want our operators to have resources when they are facing challenging, challenging times that don't necessarily rise to the level of needing police assistance, but they want some support, and we feel that's very important. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, my last comment is, uh, no, I, that's, I don't have any more questions, thank you. Um, but it had to do with competitive grants. And, and those are always great. Um, they are game changers, if, as you said. I do know, or I think, that in the future, we may not have as large an opportunity, and particularly from federal government, that it could level out. So I do have some concerns about funding sustainability. So that's good, but as long as we don't base that on operating, and I, I'm sure you and the board don't do that. But that's why I support the position, the, the grant acquisition. It's going to be tough. Um, some years are going to be better than others. Um, but I think we have to go for it, but it'll be tough from a sustainability standpoint if we bank on that every year, because some years they just won't be there. Yeah, yeah go ahead. You can respond if you like. I just would like to add that position also will be doing our procurement, federal procurement activity too. So, you know, in those lean years, there's going to be plenty to do. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, and with that, I plan to support um, Bloomington Transit. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rallo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connell. I appreciate your present presentation. I'm, I'm in general agreement with everything you're doing and, and very supportive. I'm glad the, the uh, new revenue source is being utilized and, and leveraging more federal funds. I think the direction of going to electric buses is, is very good. Um, you know, my only reservation is my basic reservation for this budget and whether it, it, I'm trying to evaluate whether a 5% increase in base salary is sufficient given the uh, challenges people are experiencing with inflation. Uh, not only this year, but the previous year and looking forward, we're looking at, you know, probably 7 or 8% in, in the coming year. So uh, that has me troubled because wage erosion is, uh, well, you know, people feel undervalued if they're, if they're not paid sufficiently and we're in competition with private sector and so forth. So, um, but overall, I'm, I'm very pleased with the budget, budget. I'll be passing this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Fi Thank you. Final comments from other members? Um, Council Member Volan, sorry about that. No, that, that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, want to echo what Councilman Rallo has said. Um, I do think that in uh, particular, uh, uh, the wage problem is acute um, for transit, that they're having trouble recruiting drivers. Uh, but otherwise, I am, uh, you know, as excited as most other people are about the future of transit, thanks to the, the new ED lit. Um, just as a matter of, uh, of course, uh, I was a little disappointed to not see the same uh, columns of numbers that other departments have had where we can see past performance. Uh, just being able to put the 2020 and 2021 years into perspective compared to 2019 uh, will be, I think, pretty important for us. Um, but uh, especially because one of the most complicated aspects of this budget is that it's very capital intensive. And it's about to get a whole lot more capital intensive. And so it's a little harder to tease out the, um, uh, the, the operating costs um, when it's presented uh, uh, without the prior years. So um, I hope that we'll get a supplement of those uh, figures as soon as it's possible, all on one table, uh, and that the chart will look like the other department's uh, uh, chart. So, and I just found the memo that was sent this morning that wasn't in the overall book. So uh, I'll read that with interest. Uh, but uh, right, so I'm going to be passing on this budget tonight because I'm very much hoping for uh, some good news between now and uh, uh, the actual budget vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I would just like to say that uh, Bloomington Transit's really got a lot of transformative things going on. It's fantastic. I'll be supporting the budget tonight. Thank you, Mr. M Mr. Connell. Oh, I missed someone. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Thank you, colleague. Um, yeah, I, I decided to jump in uh, because I am very, I'm very excited about this budget. I'm very excited about the possibilities for Bloomington Transit to get those uh, so-called choice riders with um, more direct east-west routes uh, that have, you know, advantages with going through traffic and, and um, you know, being able to prepay and all that stuff becoming very efficient. Uh, that's what we need to do to get more people out of their single occupancy vehicles and um, turn a corner with, uh, you know, climate change and trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that each of us driving our cars uh, contribute. So I'm very excited about all the innovations I see here, and I thank you very much, Mr. Connell. And Ms. I have your name. <laughs> uh, anyway, Ms. Browning, I'm so sorry. Uh, I know I've, I've seen you for many years, so, uh, and Mr. Connell is new, and, and I thank you both for the proposal, and I'll be happy to support it. Thank you very much. And it looks like we're ready for a due pass um, vote. Uh, Deputy Clerk Crosley, if you'd like to call the roll. Councilmember Rosenberger? Yes. 
Bolin? Pass. Sims? Yes. Scambleary? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Pass. Smith? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. All right, looks to me like that's six two uh, as we had one person is missing, so that would be eight. Thank you very much. Six zero two. Six zero two. Thank you, Council Member Volan. Six zero two, yes. Six zero two. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. All right, we will turn to Utilities Department. And Mr. Kelson, Director Kelson, is going to be doing it, joining us on Zoom uh, and conducting uh, the review on Zoom. So we'll work through whatever issues, if any, pop up, Mr. Kelson. So you're on. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm Vic Kelson, Utilities Director, uh, speaking to you from beyond the grave, sort of, tonight. I was diagnosed this morning, and uh, it's not pleasant. I've been warned about it, but so it goes. I'm happy to uh, present the 2023 Utilities Department budget. Uh, our budget, uh, we're the, I'm accompanied by uh, several of our senior staff, Matt Havey, our direct, Assistant Director for Finance, Phil Peden, our Assistant Director for Engineering, James Hall, our Assistant Director for Transmission and Distribution, uh, Holly McLaughlin, our Communications Manager, and Latrina Teague, who is the um, is the administrator in in the uh, um, in the director's office. One other person I'd really like to call out is Michelle Walden. Uh, Missy uh, carried uh, the load uh, on a lot of the budget preparation this year, uh, as she was the interim uh, AD for finance for a long time. And I'd just like to uh, offer my thanks to Missy. City of Bloomington Utilities exists to provide sustainable water, wastewater, and stormwater services in an economical manner and promoting public health, prosperity, and quality of life. We have about 169 full-time equivalent employees in the organization. Uh, we are composed of three utilities, uh, and we have six interconnected divisions. Uh, our utilities are the water works, the sewer works, and the stormwater utility. Uh, we have six divisions. Uh, administration, finance, engineering, operations, that's the plants, transmission and distribution, that's the pipes, um, of, what should I leave out, environmental and administration. In 2023, our major initiatives will be to continue expanding our climate action uh, efforts, uh, increasing, also increasing our sewer capacity, continuing to optimize drinking water quality, uh, continue our water main replacement program, finish the Hidden River culvert, and modernize a lot of our processes. Uh, some goals, highlights for 2022. Uh, we completed a master plan for uh, the possible relocation of utility services to the Winston Thomas property down on uh, Gordon Pike. Uh, that would be a possible long-term project. Uh, in the waterworks, we completed and implemented the 2021 rate case settlement. When we were here last year, we were still in the process of pursuing that rate case with the IURC. It was completed in December. Uh, we completed the chemical feed building at the surface water intake, and we completed $1.7 million in water main replacements. That's about two miles. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. In the sewer works, we will complete the phase one uh, modernization and capacity enhancement project at the Dillman plant. Uh, we will complete the Blucher pool phosphate removal project. Actually, we have completed that. Uh, we've completed half a million dollars in sewer lining projects and we'll complete uh, a 2022 rate review for the sewer works in the fourth quarter. And we hope to bring it to council in November. The stormwater utility, uh, the current Hidden River project is scheduled to be completed by February 2023. Uh, it very likely will be completed before then, but that's the official completion date. Uh, we are working right now on completing the design 
of the inlets at 6th and Indiana streets. Uh, we expect to finish that in 2022. And then uh, we'll do um, and also do a review of street sweeping analysis. We're looking into uh, uh, taking over the street sweeping program and improving it uh, to handle the, to uh, serve the MS4 program, the stormwater program more effectively. Uh, we'll complete our stormwater fee review uh, by the end of the fourth quarter and also bring it to council, hopefully in November. We organize our goals using the AWWA's uh, effective utility management framework. Uh, the framework has 10 activity areas. We'll only cover five of them tonight in the interest of brevity, but they're all covered in the memo. Uh, in product quality, uh, product quality, or the goal is to provide fit for service, water, wastewater, and sewer services, um, meeting all the goals and all the standards uh, uh, required by uh, our regulators. We, on the water side, we'll continue to operate the manure water treatment plant uh, for 24-7, 365 without violations. We'll maintain and improve our water quality, and we will complete the service line inventory for the lead service line project. In sewer, uh, we will operate all the plants 24-7, 365 without violations. That's two plants. Uh, we'll complete the design for the phase two uh, capacity expansion project at Dillman, and we'll complete lining projects for six additional miles of sewer. Um, we established a clear water program. This is a program that's intended to reduce the amount of uh, flows like uh, uh, sump pumps that are improperly connected to sanitary sewer or uh, rain gutters on homes that are improperly connected. Uh, we've been funding this uh, with contributions from uh, developers. So basically our objective is to offset the additional flows from new development uh, projects um, by eliminating these uh, um, inappropriate uh, feeds into the plant. Uh, that's gonna be about 800,000 gallons per day in the Southeast Basin uh, and about 300,000 gallons per day in the West. Uh, we'll also be completing the first phase of strategies from the stormwater master plan. This is mostly ordinance changes to make our stormwater master plan align better with the UDO. An operational optimization. Uh, the goal of operational optimization is to make sure that all of our processes are operating as effectively and efficiency, efficiently as they can. Uh, this also includes making sure that there's appropriate planning for uh, new equipment and repairs of equipment. Uh, all of our utilities now are working on deploying uh, three new uh, analytical tools using the CityWorks asset management system. Uh, we've begun deploying this uh, in our environmental program and in transmission and distribution. The plants will come next. We're also going to be implementing a distribution SCADA system that's supervisory control and data acquisition at the East Tank. Uh, that project was delayed from 2022 uh, because of supply chain issues. Our oh, by the way, that project also includes adding a mixer to the tank to improve water quality. In employee and leadership development, our objective is to retain, to develop, train, and retain um, a high quality, reliable, motivated workforce. Um, in all of our utilities, we will be investing at least 1.5% of our personnel budget for professional training as uh, requested by the mayor's office. Uh, we do see, make sure that we have CPR certification for every single one of our crews. Uh, at least one person on every crew is CPR certified. And for our managers, since we have a couple of, of newer assistant directors, we will be doing process improvement training across the organization. And financial viability, our objective in, that, in the financial viability uh, budget category is to make sure that we, uh, we may use, uh, make appropriate use of ratepayer dollars that we operate in the most cost-effective manner that we can and that we make sure that the utility always has the resources it needs to deal with uh, problems that will arise. Um, the City Works Asset Management Program is a huge part of our financial viability uh, efforts for next year. Uh, this will, we're going to be doing centralized work order and inventory systems at all three plants and also in 
transmission distribution and elsewhere in the organization. So we're bringing all of this together in one place. Uh, for the stormwater, sewer and stormwater utility uh, in 2023, we will implement any rate changes that might arise from the 2022 rate case that we will be bringing this fall. Uh, we'll be implementing those in the first quarter 2023. And finally, infrastructure strategy and performance is the making sure that we have a plan for keeping all of our infrastructure, especially buried in uh, infrastructure, in good condition uh, with the plan towards uh, replacement and uh, long-term maintenance and reliability. One of the big efforts here is the service line inventory project. Uh, US EPA is requiring that we identify uh, where the lead service lines are in our distribution system. Uh, this requires, uh, what we're doing is we're doing um, a combination of field examinations. You see an il illustration here, the mayor helped us drill one of the holes, uh, where we can go down and look actually at the service line for, an, for a resident's home. Uh, we have to look at both the city's side of that service line and the customer's side of the service line. Uh, we will. We are collecting all of this, uh, these data, and they all help to inform a machine learning model that will uh, demonstrate what portions of the city are most likely to have lead service lines. And over time, we can uh, continue to refine this model uh, to uh, to identify the, all the service lines that need to be replaced. Now, replacement would happen uh, later in the program, and uh, what will probably uh, most likely do is add the presence of lead service lines as one of the categories uh, for prioritizing water main replacements. Next year, we'll replace at least two miles of water mains. We will complete the East Take coating and SCADA project, and we'll complete the design and begin construction on several projects at the Monroe Water Treatment Plant and the South, South Central Booster. Most importantly, at the Monroe plant uh, is the uh, replacement of our filter media and the completion of a belt press installation. In sewer, we'll complete the phase two design for the Dillman Road plant improvements. This would be the work required to get that plant up to 20 million gallons per day capacity. Presently, it's at 15. Uh, we know the project that we've done has eliminated uh, one of the bottlenecks in the plant, and we will be talking with IDEM about the next phase of the project uh, hopefully in late September to uh, to discuss what we're going to do next. We're also uh, going to improve the solids handling uh, facilities at the Blue Tree Pool plant. Presently, they get the solids get pressed and then they sit outside and get sometimes get rained on, which means then you have to let them dry. Uh, we'd like to have a, a barn for the solids like we do at, at the Dillman plant. We'll be replacing four lift stations in our system. Uh, we will continue lining sewers and be looking into the prospect of lining uh, a little bit of sewer laterals as well, if that's justified. And then finally, I mentioned the, the Clearwater program, trying to eliminate um, those improper connections to our sewers uh, that will be advancing that program in 2023. Now, I've talked a lot about the Hidden River project over the last couple of years. Um, the illustrations you see here are actually models that were developed by the engineer who's doing the, the design work for that uh, for the upstream portion of the project. Uh, he also did the work on the downstream portion of the project. The model that you see, the results that you see here on the left, uh, is a forecast. <coughs> excuse me of of the extent of flooding that would come from a 100-year uh, storm event. That's actually just a little bit larger than the storm event from June of 2021. Uh, when we complete the current tunnel project, we still have an undersized inlet up here at 6th and Indiana near Franklin Hall. Uh, we are currently in the process of doing design work for that second project uh, that would complete the entire Hidden River system. And once completed, this is the extent of flooding from a 100-year flood. We'll also be continuing our residential stormwater grants program for about uh, 15 to 20 homeowners. Uh, our budget highlights, uh, we're in the <coughs> overall, the water budget increases from about, uh, I can't 
Okay. Uh, you'll see an 11.9 increase in revenues for water. The reason for that is that um, we budget all of the revenue that we anticipate. And as you remember, uh, we were in the process of a rate case when we did the budget planning for last year. So our budget did not account for the completion of the rate case. The rate case gave us a little over 8% additional revenue. Um, and that now is, did not appear in our 2022 budget amount, but it will appear in our 2023 budget amount. We did receive or are receiving that revenue in 2022 and, and we are utilizing it for projects as, at, at the current time. In sewer, we anticipate about a 3% increase in revenue and in stormwater about a 2% increase in revenue. Uh, budget in the uh, waterworks, our 2023, uh, proposal is uh, for um, it says about three uh, percent in the in the proposed personnel budget. Uh, I believe that will be finalized by the by the controller's office and when the council is finished with the budget process. Uh, supplies increased by about forty percent. That's mostly inflation in the cost of chemicals and also uh, reaccounting for uh, the, all the chemical costs. Uh, this is in the waterworks. Uh, in other services, twenty four percent. Uh, and in uh, ENR, ENR is the money that's left after we pay all the other categories. It will go down by about 11% uh, compared to 2022. Uh, however, uh, so a lot of that is offset by the fact we just, uh, that, that money is available for capital expansions and capital improvements. And we just, as you know, uh, council, we just sold bonds earlier this year and those bonds will pay for uh, the vast majority of the projects on the water side. Uh, significant changes uh, is our revenue increase, uh, the supplies increases, uh, other services and charges, as I mentioned a moment ago, and then the decrease in ENR, and that's uh, occurring because of the, all the bond funded projects. In the sewer works, we're budgeting uh, 8.6 million for personnel services, that's 3% with caveat I had on the water utility. Again, supplies increased about by about 20, 28%. Other services by about 30, there are 31%. And then our ENR also declines, but in the case of the sewer works, that's because we're getting towards the end of a rate cycle and we'll be coming uh, to you to discuss that in a few months. In the sewer works, uh, revenue increases by 3%, uh, supplies by about 28%. Other services are pretty flat and then extensions and replacements decreases. And then finally, for the stormwater utility, uh, we're budgeting for a 3% increase in personnel services, uh, a 2% increase in supplies, a 2% increase in, increase in other services, and then our ENR will be up about 11%. Uh, we will be holding steady on the in green infrastructure investment at $400,000 next year. And the storm sinking, that's the payments on the bond for the Hidden River Project and other projects. The big changes are, of course, uh, the supplies um, and the increase in other services, or decrease, sorry, the increase in other services and charges, and then the decrease in ENR. So in conclusion, uh, our 2023 budget will support all our stated goals of expanding climate action, increasing our sewer capacity, optimizing our drinking water quality, making water main replacements a reality, at finishing the Hidden River project and modernizing all of our processes in house. Thanks. Uh, everybody knows that it's been a difficult time uh, for personnel. And what you see here is a collection of some of the people who have retired uh, or left CBU uh, since the 2021 budget. So I wanna thank all of these people for their service and uh, I will continue to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Kelson, and of course, thanks to all those folks who uh, have retired. Um, all right, it's now it's time for Council Member questions. Uh, Council Member Rallo, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Kelson. Um, I would like to ask, uh, just to lead off, employee compensation, I assume it's a base pay increase of 5%. Is that correct? Uh, Is what that's what the controller's office informed us, yes. Okay. Um, I uh, 
I've heard a lot of uh, concern about the water taste, and of course, with this is a perennial problem. Uh, it's, it's harmless or, organics from algal blooms, as I recall, seasonal. Uh, is there anything that we can do about it or that we are doing? Activated carbon wow. or, or something like that? Um, I didn't call you to tee that one up, but um, I'm glad you said you asked. Um, it's it's, it's well, being, it's the buzz it. right now. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, we do feed activated carbon. Uh, we are experiencing a late summer surge uh, as we did last year. Last year it came a little later in the year. Uh, this is uh, because of uh, large uh, algal densities. Uh, actually, in the last few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, we measured the, the largest algal concentrations we've ever measured in the intake water. Uh, it's come down some. The water tastes a little better now, but we're still working on it. Uh, right now, we are maxed out on feeding our, our activated carbon to the plant, uh, so it will probably be another few weeks, and hopefully we'll get some, some better weather. Cooler weather and some rain would sure help. But what are we doing long term? Uh, this morning, we, we were talking about this, and I've asked uh, our staff to uh, uh, look into the possibility for uh, in situ change, uh, treatment of the water in the vertical water column uh, near the intake. Uh, some, some utilities actually can do this by just mixing the water in the lake. Now, the problem is we don't own the lake. Uh, the, the Corps of Engineers and DNR manage the lake. So if we're going to do that, we're gonna to have to work with them as partners. But you know, one time is a fluke, two times is pattern. Uh, we, we used to have uh, taste and odor issues every year until 2017 when we started feeding carbon. Uh, we did not have another taste and odor uh, event until last year, and now we're having one again. So once is a fluke and twice is a, is a pattern. So uh, we are starting to explore uh, what things we might be able to do outside the plant because we really have maxed out what we can do inside the plant. Okay, thank, thank you. You're uh, working on that issue, that topic. Um, I don't have much time remaining, but my other questions regarded the health of Lake Monroe uh, and the, uh, what we're doing about that. We were partnering with the local groups uh, in terms of monitoring and so forth. And I'm also interested in the, the FTEs that are uh, being ad added, the uh, employees that are being added by your department. But we could talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would love to respond to the efforts to protect the lake. We are working with the Lake Monroe Water Fund and the Friends of Lake Monroe. Uh, we're making uh, cash contributions to the Water Fund this year. Uh, the Friends of Lake Monroe, we continue to do a lot of in-kind in uh, contributions for water testing and uh, those kinds of things. So we are working with both of those organizations. It's a good relationship. And um, I think we're making some progress. Uh, changes in the lake seem to be happening uh, pretty fast right now. And we just, uh, I think when you have these stretches of two or three weeks with no rain and the hot sun beating down, uh, that's, that's not the old pattern. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Mr. Kelson, I don't want to add to your COVID misery, but I do have a question about maintenance, and you've got a line here about water main replacements. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know we spend quite a bit annually, and we uh, try to uh, replace 2.5 miles every year, but are there ways to kind of predict where water main breaks are going to happen before they happen? Or do you just kind of have to wait and see where the vulner vulnerabilities are before you can kind of get out in front of some of that? Well, what we do is uh, our engineers uh, look at the records for where we've had water main breaks, where we've had poor water quality conditions, uh, where we've had leaks, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, and then we prioritize segments of pipe for replacement. Uh, this year, uh, we did uh, an experiment working with a, a small consulting firm. Uh, we entered into a $5,000 contract to do a machine learning model of our water main data uh, to identify where places are that may be more likely to have a water main break in the near future. Uh, so we're still working on getting through the end of that but uh, it's an interesting idea uh, to, to try and forecast it. What's, 
what we're doing with uh, water main replacement, of course, is we prioritize the segments that have the, the biggest issues, the most likelihood of, of water main breaks, and then the largest water quality problem. So that's what we're doing right now. In 2024, we will be bringing an increase in the water main replacement program uh, that was funded through our 2021 rate case. The reason for that is we're right now replacing about two, a little over two miles a year in water mains. We have over 400 miles of pipe. So that's about a 215 year replacement cycle for pipe that should last 80 to 100 years. So we're trying to get to four miles a year uh, in 2024 uh, to try and get closer to, 100, uh, to a 100 year replacement cycle uh, for, for the old pipe. Thank you. Uh, if I could follow up about the uh, Hidden River Pathway project, you mentioned that supply chain issues have been kind of a, an issue for utilities and taking longer for projects to be completed. Um, is that the case with this one from that flood of June 21? Uh, it seems like it's taking quite a while. Um, you say the engineering was going to be completed in 2022, but then the completion date is actually now set for February of 23. Is that correct? And that'll be completely done? Uh, so here's, here's the way it works. The current project that we're doing uh, began in February of 2021. It had a two-year planned uh, project life. So it would complete in February of 2023. We appear to be on, uh, um, on schedule to get done sooner. They have opened 4th Street. They have not opened Grant Street yet. So we're getting pretty close to the end. However, there's still another project to do, and that's the inlet up there at 6th and Indiana. That would be the next project that we'd have to fund out of the next sewer uh, rate re or storm, storm water rate review. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bowen. Do you have a question? Thank you very much. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Kelson. I'm sorry you're under the weather. Um, I uh, had a question going back to um, the, the salaries uh, in each um, of the utilities. It looks like the, the general uh, increases 3% for salaries. So I'm trying to match that with what you said uh, came from the controller's office, which is 5%. And the controller's office also told us yesterday that there was nothing calculated in for AFSCME represented uh, employees as far as pay increases. So could you speak a little more about uh, the salary lines? <clears throat> I don't believe that the salary lines have been fully updated yet. So that's something I will ask the controller about that tomorrow and get back to you as soon as I can. OK. Um, uh, I have another follow-up uh, to something that Councilmember Rollo said. Um, and maybe I misunderstood him, but he said he was concerned about in increases in FTE. Um, are there new positions proposed, and uh, how many, and what are they? There are new positions proposed, uh, not very many, and I'm I, uh, at, off the top of my head, I can't tell you which ones they are that are in the present budget proposal. I'll get that list and send it to you. Um, we, we made a number of requests, but I've forgotten which ones they were that were finally approved. I can, I'll get you the list. Okay, yeah, the one that I did see is engineering field technician. Um, oh, well, I'll share that one. That's a locator. That's a person who goes out and does locating for um, in TND. Uh, locating is a matter of life and death, and we have to locate our pipes whenever somebody is getting ready to do a dig and uh, start digging. So when they call 811, say they want to do a project, we have to get out there and locate that pipe. Right now, uh, Projects have been increasing dramatically for a very long time. Uh, we have only two people in that position, and they are both at retirement age. So uh, over time, we're going to be trying to, we want to have three of them because there are so many more locates happening all the time. Locates protect the public, protect our people, um, and they are required by law. So we want to make sure we have the staff required to do it. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, in my remaining uh, seconds, I wanted to ask about um, the uh, bond payments that are in your budget memo. It's page 15 of your particular memo. Um, it just has uh, various bonds and amounts, and I wasn't sure if that was the amount that was left 
remaining to be paid? That's the amount to be paid in the coming year? Or what exactly those figures uh, meant? Um, I'm, I'd have to look at the table again. It's been a while since I looked at it. Yeah. Uh, typically what we have there is the amount of debt service we pay on each bond each year. Uh, some of those bonds are gonna be retired in the next few years. Um, so, I, but I can get you the amortization schedule and, and discuss it with you. Okay, yeah, if you could just uh, clarify what this list of figures is on page 15 okay. of your memo. Yep, Mr. Underwood, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm, I'm eating into my time. Question. Uh, the 5% was applied to all the utility non-union salaries um, within the uh, budgeting software. So the 5% was uh, included in utilities as well. Thank you, Jeff. That was for the non-union employees. Correct. Right. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, on this first round from council members? Uh, Mr. Rolla, did you need a follow-up or was your question answered? Uh, I'll follow up at some point with a written uh, question, I think, because I don't have the information I was looking for. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelson, and I hope, you f hope you're feeling better. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Did you, Matt, want, you have something you want to say? Just one more thing. Uh, Council Member Sandberg asked about the the third phase of the or the, the next phase of the Hidden River project. Uh, we are hopeful, but we're not making any promises. We are hopeful that that project might begin in 2023. It's most likely to begin in 2024, but if all the, if all the pieces fall in the right place, uh, we would be able to begin that project in 2023. And also delays in the, in the Hidden River project, even though we're ahead of schedule, uh, we spent a lot of time dealing with contamination from uh, the Leonard's uh, laundry site at Third and Lincoln, and that held the project up for for several months while we were cleaning out contaminated soil over there. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, well, we're ready for public comment. Um, are there people in the hall that want to come up and uh, comment on this budget? And if not, uh, we will ask Mr. Lucas to. Uh, will you make that great announcement about? Uh, being able to do it online. That would like to comment on the utilities department budget, you can indicate your desire to speak by using the raise hand button, uh, which you can find in your control bar by clicking either the reactions tab or the more tab. If you're not able to locate that button, just send a chat to the meeting host and we can recognize you that way. All right, thank you. While we're, while we're waiting, anybody have a comment? That, that you feel like making on the, on the utilities budget? Okay. How are we doing over there? No, no takers on Zoom. All right. Let's go back to uh, let's go back to final comment on uh, uh, from uh, council members. Council member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, I have the utmost respect for all of our good workers and utilities, and one of the things I think was mentioned in the report as I was reading it is about the attrition, you know, the loss of long-term employees as they retire, and the need to have a culture where that historical knowledge and that uh, expertise and that skill set is passed on. Uh, and I do believe you're making attempts to do that within utilities to make sure that as people retire, we don't lose a lot of that. Uh, brain power, if you will, that is so critical um, for something that requires the skills and engineering and, and uh, work of our utilities workers. So uh, kudos to trying to hang in there and making sure our workforce is up to the task. Um, I, uh, I have appreciated um, learning from all the good people from utilities from my first experience as being on the utilities service board and knowing how hard you work and how difficult it is to retrofit aging uh, infrastructure. So thank you for that. I'll be supporting the budget tonight. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Anyone else will, uh, would like to ha have a final comment? Council Member Piedmont Smith. Um, yes, I, um, there, there are a lot of AFSCME employees that work for utilities, and uh, as I mentioned yesterday, it, it, it disturbs me quite a bit that uh, there's no placeholder in this budget for uh, a wage increase for them, um, even though there 
I, there will be a wage increase, we just don't know what it, what it will be. Uh, and so I just, uh, I just can't in good conscience uh, support this at this time when that has not been taken into consideration. I do understand from Mr. Underwood that usually the um, uh, labor contracts that are concluded after the budget process result in you know reassignment of uh, funds uh, later on, but um, I, I just think uh, there's also a, a certain symbolic uh, value to say we're not putting anything in the budget for this. Um, which rubs me the wrong way. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pass on this budget and, and hope to see a resolution to the labor negotiations um, that give a, an equitable uh, wage increase for ASWE employees. Thank you. Councilmember Rallo. Yes, I'd just like to echo what my colleague just said, uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. I think it's difficult to evaluate a budget without having uh, a full idea of the uh, expenditures um, for a significant number of employees in the city uh, and to what extent we will be compensating them. Um, I also have concerns about the general 5% increase for non-union employees, whether that's sufficient. Um, otherwise, I think that the work that you're doing is very good and, and uh, especially efforts regarding water quality, green infrastructure, uh, projects re regarding stormwater, upgrading our uh, infrastructure and so forth, all, all of those I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with. Uh, so I hope we can get clarity uh, before we have to pass this budget in the fall um, from the uh, administration and the controller. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's about where we're at. Uh, any other comments? No? Shall we ask for a due pass recommendation? Please call the roll. Thank you. Pass. Yes. Scambolieri? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Pass. Smith? Pass. And Piedmont Smith? Pass. And Rosenbarger? Pass. Thank you. Thank you. That appears to be 6 3, so, sorry, 3 0 6. Did I get that right? Uh, oh, 3 0 5. Four. Sorry, I can't count tonight. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Director Kelson. I hope you're feeling better. Thank you. Mr. Chair, could you verify that uh, tally again? I counted four passes. Three, zero, five. There were five passes? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelson. Uh, moving right along, we're going to move to uh, Chief Jason Moore. So we're going to talk about the fire department. So uh, you're on, um, Chief Moore. Great. Thank you. And thank you all. And I'm sorry I can't be there uh, in person. Uh, but moving forward, let's get into the fire department budget. So why do we exist? Um, I've said this many a times. Uh, we are here for excellent public safety. And I think our record speaks to that. Uh, we are now at 11 uh, civilian saves over the past five years. And we're also at zero fire fatalities uh, for the same uh, metric for five years. Um, I will also note that we've added a new uh, division, the integrated health care, which we'll talk about uh, in depth in the, few, in the rest of the budget. So for background, we are 113.5 full-time equivalents. Uh, the only part-time position we have is an administrative assistant. There are five divisions, operations, which is the big red trucks, uh, training and education, which prepares us to do our job. Prevention, uh, which is that getting out in front of the issues. Uh, that also ties in with investigation, knowing when something happens. <clears throat> um, how did it happen and how can we can prevent that? And then working with the prevention department. And then again, our last section is the integrated health care, which is what we have started this year. 
major initiatives, community risk reduction. Uh, that is not just stopping fires. That's looking at all of our risk within the community and how we could better serve uh, the public and making sure that we are preventing accidents and injury before they happen. Innovative emergency response. Uh, that is something that we are really proud of. Uh, we're constantly looking at, is there a better way of doing it? Which again, we'll talk about quite a bit tonight uh, when I get to my 2023 budget. Workforce diversification. Uh, you can see in the memo that we have made significant strides. We still have quite a bit of uh, distance to go to make sure that we truly match our population, but we are definitely making uh, movements in the right, right uh, heading. Station renovations, capital replacement plan. This is probably the biggest change that you'll see in our budget. Uh, we have been trying to uh, you know, duct tape and patch things together for, for several years. We now have a plan that we are looking to uh, implement, which is on a 50 year cycle, uh, much like we do with the apparatus replacement, uh, making sure that not only do we catch up to where we were, uh, but also uh, make sure that we do not ever find ourselves in the situation that we are at now where uh, four of our five stations have been deemed uh, needing replacements. Enhanced employee training and education. Uh, that is something that we're very proud of. Uh, we definitely spend a lot of time and energy making sure that our employees are ready for the next steps in their career. Um, and I would also say uh, just running a process here not too long ago, where we had external evaluators. Uh, it was really good to hear from all of them that they would have been more than happy to accept any of our employees into an upper level position in their department. And then obviously <clears throat> uh, firefighter safety and health which we know if we take good care of our firefighters, we look after them with all the hazards that they are encountering in their day-to-day -day world, uh, that they will better serve the community. For 2022, I just wanna to touch on a few uh, issues. Uh, providing appropriate response, uh, something that again, we are uh, really proud of. We do generally have great outcomes. Um, you'll notice that we have a goal that has been inactive, uh, developed a quality assurance program. Uh, that was going to be for a new position uh, that has just now been filled. So we do look forward to maybe even putting that goal back online for 2022. Uh, continue the capital replacement plan. Uh, that is again, making sure that all of your investments in public safety equipment uh, do not lapse and that we do not find ourselves in the situation we were with the rust in the vehicles and the unsafe working conditions for our firefighters. <clears throat> uh, continue major renovation projects, even with stations that are due for replacements, uh, we do know that it will take several years uh, we do not want to uh, not address some of the issues in those stations and make sure that our firefighters are in uh, appropriate conditions for, for what they're doing and how they're serving our community. Um, and again, we do want to continue efforts to increase in our operability uh, within Monroe County and the state of Indiana. And again, we'll get into that a little bit more. Fire prevention, uh, smoke detectors are known to save lives. We do have a goal. We are well on, a, on our path to finishing that goal this year. Uh, one goal that you will notice will change from 2022 to 23 is making the contact with every business. Um, we have a roundabout estimate that it was 3,491 businesses. We are looking at uh, how to best use our resources and then not everything would require an inspector to come out. So we'll talk about that in 23 a little bit. <clears throat> we're also going to make sure that we're providing public education to the K through 12 schools and at IU. For training and education, we're well on our way and we are uh, on track to complete um, that all of our employees receive all of their annual training. And again, I want to remind uh, council that your investments in our firefighters training is to keep us at the skill level. Uh, we are an all hazards department and the more things that we uh, address for the community, every one of those have a training commitment and we want to make sure that we're following up with those. Uh, you'll also notice providing instruction on 40 new certifications. Uh, back in 2017, we adopted a professional standards guideline that outlined how we would get from where we were at to uh, every position in the department meeting the national standards. We are well on that path, but that 40 new certifications is how we maintain uh, keeping up with what is required to be in our jobs. Providing a minimum of 20 hours of continuing education, we're into investigations now. Uh, again, uh, making sure that they have that support network and uh, that you know they can really dig into and figure out why we're having these issues. Uh, the 20 hours of continuing ed plus the professional memberships and support networks is how we are successful. Uh, and also working with the police department and other community partners uh, to include the state fire marshal's office to make sure that when something does happen, especially if it is an arson or something of that nature, that we are 
uh, finishing it and keeping up with that and actually prosecuting people. The new section that we have is the community care. Uh, that's what it was identified in the 2022 budget. We are renaming that integrated health care. Um, you will notice on this slide that there is a nice little certificate there. When we started down this path, there was no official uh, pathway to get to where we were trying to get. Um, the state has now formalized what that looks like. And what you see on that slide is our new licensing that was required so that we could establish this new service. Uh, I will also let you know uh, that we are way behind on when we wanted to get it established, but we do have two accepted job offers for our first two uh, community care uh, coordinators, which is super exciting. And it is going to be the next level of how we handle things in Bloomington. One goal we did not get to, obviously, because we did not start the program until uh, here in about October when we get fully staffed with it, is establishing uh, or evaluating the feasibility of establishing billing service. Um, this is a complicated issue. There are now five, maybe six of these programs in the state, and not a single one has figured out this piece of it. I'm not going to promise that we'll be the first, but it's definitely something that we're going to evaluate. So 2023, looking into emergency operations, uh, we want to provide that appropriate response. Uh, and again, we've broken these down. Structure fire calls, the turnout time is 80 seconds or less. Travel time is four minutes or less. And the travel time for the total response force which is described by the ISO standard as two engines in an aerial at eight minutes or less. Um, you need all three of these pieces to be successful. So it's getting the firefighters on the trucks very quickly. It's also getting the first unit there quickly, but it's that total response force is where we uh, really kind of stand out. Uh, it's getting everybody there within that eight minutes is how we have very successful outcomes. For emergency medical, you'll notice turnout time is less. They do not require the fire gear, so there's less time allocated for that. And the travel time is still a four minutes or less. And for all other emergencies, turnout time, 80 seconds. Again, uh, things like car fires or uh, you know anything else, 80 seconds is requiring the gear. And we're gonna give a little bit more time uh, for that because there is no actual standard for this. But what these three uh, breakouts are, are the national standard for fire service. And again, those standards are built off of scientific studies to show what is needed to be successful. Quality assurance program, this goal uh, was a 2022, it's carried into 23. We wanna make sure we're reviewing 100% of the calls that are second alarm or greater. That's talking about calls where the initial uh, resources were not enough and we needed to have a, another call or another alarm generated. Uh, if it has a fatality or if it's a firefighter near miss. And then 10% of EMS calls that require an intervention so anytime we give any medications, we do something to assist that patient. We wanna make sure that we're reviewing those EMS calls and making sure it's appropriate and also start providing feedback to the state and other entities to potentially guide how treatments are, are being done. Continuing efforts to increase interoperability. Uh, you'll notice here the logo is ProQA. The biggest strides we've made in 2022 and we wanna carry in 23 is making sure that from dispatch, everything is being handled at the same level uh, with the same amount of, um, you know, I would say the dispatchers uh, have the tools they need to make good, good decisions for us. Um, so the ProQA is how we have gotten from uh, when I was here at the very beginning where we sent everything or nothing, we can now tailor down our resources and make sure that we are sending just what is needed to those calls, which again is uh, one, uh, helps us being available for other calls uh, because we have had a major increase uh, you'll note my memo, I think a 37% increase from uh, 2021 to 20, or I'm sorry, 2020 to 2021. And we are on track to see that same amount now. Fire prevention investigations for 23, uh, completing 1600 general inspections. Uh, you'll notice that that is quite a bit less than what we were looking at before, uh, but we also wanna add this self-inspection program. There are a lot of buildings in the city that uh, we go in and all we need to do is check if the tags on the extinguishers are good, if the detectors are good, if lights work. Um, so those are what we call low hazard occupancies. And those would benefit from a self-inspection program where someone could take a picture of it and send it to us or where we could have uh, you know, just, just a, a lower level uh, entity go out or take a look at it. So we are gonna evaluate several options for that. We wanna make sure that we have that one in-person interactive or online contacts. Um, for the schools um, within fire prevention education. Again, uh, we build this so that 
everyone is taught from the very beginning about fire safety as they become adults, uh, it does help the overall community. A new goal for fire prevention, building plan review. Uh, we are one of the few entities in this region that we review every building plan. I think Vic uh, mentioned it and others have mentioned it, that there is a lot of construction, uh, more than anything that we've ever seen. Um, so we wanna establish an expectation for contractors that if they follow the process, how long would we be holding on to those plans? So we wanna have them for uh, 10 business days or less, 90% of the time. We also wanna continue facilitating at least two uh, Indiana University fire safety sponsored events and continue with the installing smoke detectors, replacing batteries. Again, the goal is to make sure that we have working uh, detectors uh, within the city. We wanna keep up with the 20 hours continuing education uh, for pre prevention and investigations. And again, uh, keeping up with those community uh, engagements and making sure that people are out and, and having a good network for when things happen and that we're just not, not fully aware of or that we're not used to. Uh, these professional memberships are really, really important, uh, especially in that one where fires are down and we are constantly uh, trying to learn everything we can from what fires we do have. Training and education, uh, increasing firefighter safety. We're gonna keep up, you'll see a lot of this is very uh, redundant. So the 420 hours, 24 hours of annual refresher, Again, making sure that we stay uh, compliant with our minimums uh, and making sure that we are competent at doing our jobs. We wanna make sure 100% of our employees receive diversity and inclusion training, uh, hosting the two classes from the outside, keeps us fresh and keeps us aware of what's happening outside of our community. And we're gonna continue with the 40 new certification goal. You'll notice that this is new. Uh, we did start an athletic uh, trainer program, a tactical athlete program. Uh, BPD had that the year prior. Uh, we just now got on with board, but we want to make sure we increase our participation rate from 75 to 85%. And we're going to start doing better jobs of tracking not only the injuries and recovery times that are, you know, in the OSHA standards, but moving forward, we want to make sure that we're doing a better job of, is this program panning out? Is it paying off? And I will tell you just from initial uh, on look, it is paying off uh, in big dividends for our people. Integrated healthcare. We wanna expand the current mobile integrated healthcare program. I know Chief Decoff is going to speak briefly about uh, potential changes. All of this is trying to evolve our emergency service delivery model. So not everything requires a sworn firefighter or sworn police officer. Um, so they now have police social workers, they have their community of people. And then our integrated healthcare, uh, we currently only have the two this year. We're looking to expand that two for next year. Uh, which will allow us to provide these services Sunday through Saturday um, and really start uh, handling these issues before and after the 911 calls. We do wanna continue looking at the feasibility of establishing billing service, which will help make this more sustainable. And then the big thing that we're gonna start focusing on is our top users of those frequent 911 services. So uh, again, um, all of the positions that we've asked for are to help uh, on the supply demand side. You know, if we have fewer calls going to firefighters, then that is fewer calls that they need to deal with, um, which means when we are short staffed or we are having issues that it is not as much of an impact. Uh, also knowing what, what is, we're facing as a nation and just the national trends, um, everyone is seeing call increases. Um, so this is our way from the fire department of being proactive and start addressing the issues. Again, the before and the after 911 so that they do not constantly rely on that, that safety net. So our total budget request, which does include general fund, the PS lit and the new ED lit is uh, 16,240,000. It is an overall increase. Um, I will say uh, a lot of what the increase is, is the debt service fund, but we'll get into that. So category one personnel is 11.6, almost 11.7 million, an increase of 10%. That does include the three new positions uh, that we've asked for. Uh, it does have a 2% increase in wages for union employees, which was from their negotiated contract, and then 5% increase for non-union employees. The three positions we've asked for is two more community care coordinators and one more deputy fire marshal. I wanna point out uh, that one of the, the things that stands out from a fire service administration standpoint is the total number of false alarms that we go on. We focused our efforts really at the primary of uh, looking at the fires, which is the things that actually kill people. Uh, but we are starting to see a general increase in uh, false alarms. This new deputy fire marshal not will only add capacity to the fire inspection side, 
but this will be someone that we're going to try to have dedicated towards uh, looking at those false alarms, working with the business and occupant owners um, to help prevent them. Um, and at some point, I will get around to getting the ordinances updated. We need to have someone that is going to review all of the false alarm uh, reports to make sure they're actually false alarms uh, and not just miscategorized so that if we do have to get to the point of issuing fines or fees, that we're not going to find ourselves uh, in, in trouble. Category two uh, is just under 400,000. It's an increase of 15%. I will note for that uh, almost the entire increase from that is the fuel. Um, category three, other services and charges, it is a 112% increase. Uh, and again, a lot of that is the ED lit, that is the debt service fund. Uh, we also have increases in there for uh, paying rent on our temporary uh, fire headquarters. Uh, knowing what we're getting into with construction of fire stations, there is money in there for consultants. This is a specialized building and something that we do not want to make a 50 year mistake on. Uh, and I will note that even in category three, we are seeing uh, dividends paid out from having the, the better fleet. So uh, we did see a decrease in our category three expense for fleet services. Category four, which is where most of our uh, big, big ticket items come into for the fire department is 1.5, almost $1.6 million. It is an increase of 36%. Uh, again, years that we buy a truck versus years we don't buy a truck is where you see those major increases. So some of the things that we're looking to do, uh, 42,500 for a fire gear washer, we're maintaining the firefighting gear, uh, that is making sure that our firefighters are safe, that we are following cancer prevention protocols. Um, if you'll remember, uh, probably about four or five years ago, we made major investments in ITS infrastructure for our department. It's all coming due for replacement, so you'll see that. For vehicles, uh, replacing engine five, it is now $820,000. That was almost a 30% increase from the last engine we, we bought. Uh, and this is what's happening with inflation. We're also looking at some of these may take two, two and a half, or maybe even three years for delivery. Uh, we want to replace prevention two, a part of our replacement cycle. There is a vehicle for the new deputy fire marshal. And then there are two new electric cars. Uh, one would be solely dedicated to the community cares and one would be a pool vehicle for our, our staff to use. Station improvements, uh, station two is one of the only stations that was not uh, set up to be completely replaced, is having some major roof issues. Uh, so there is $255,000 for a roof replacement. Station three, four, and five, uh, much lower amounts. Again, we're just trying to keep these stations uh, decent and working until they can be replaced. Overall, you'll see uh, that our total budget, again, is a little over 16 million. Um, which is a significant increase of 22%. And I will tell you that everything that you uh, allow us to invest in this department has paid dividends, not only in saving lives, but in also uh, making the community safer. So with that, uh, I am more than happy to take any of your questions and thank you for your consideration of our budget. Thank you, Chief Moore. Uh, questions from uh, council members? Council member Sims. Thank you, Chief Moore, for that presentation. Um, we'll start, first of all, you were talking about work, workforce diversification, and you stated you want the workforce to match our population. Did I hear correctly? Yes. Uh, you know, part of that is making sure that we are uh, mirroring what our population that we serve. Okay. Um, what is the, the population of under, underrepresented um, members in Bloomington? Do you know? Uh, I think since the, the last update, you're somewhere around 7%. Um, but I'd be more than happy to dig into that. Um, I do have a lot of our studies and a lot of the work we've been doing with very specifics on that that I could get to you. No, I understand. We're, we're just having a discussion. Uh, I've heard this every year, and it's, it's nobody's fault, but just kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, and by my count, you, well, we have 113 full-time employees, 113.5. Um, and let's say roughly one form of population, let's say 4%. So that's roughly five, the number. And so that would be five on one particular population out of 113.5. Um, 
so when you say match our population, is that, are those the numbers that you're, you're striving for? I, honestly, I'm, I'm not trying to play a quota game. We, we want to make sure that we include anybody and everybody and find the best that our community has to offer to work for our department. Um, but when you do try to set a hard line goal, then yes, we want to match the percentages of our community is where we're trying to bit, uh, get to. And uh, we have made significant strides. In fact, I believe the particular population setting you're talking about, we are on par with what, what our community is. Okay, thank you. And, and just to be clear, when I uh, discuss that with you or our other uh, public safety folks, we already assume that you're gonna try to get the very best of the best when you're in, so I, I don't think that really needs to be said, I think, in this particular case. Uh, my next question is, who provides diversity and inclusion training to the firefighters? Uh, we have gotten it from HR. Uh, we have seeked out and found uh, people that specialize in that type of training. Um, so the last one that we brought from the outside, other than what HR provided, uh, was uh, from IU, and he is now uh, working for the Indiana Colts. Um, so again, we're, we're seeking out many opportunities to make sure that we're, we're getting a good cross-section and we're getting good training. Okay, thank you. Um, with regard to integrated health care, um, and I guess I'm confused about uh, establishing a billing service, um, and it says through insurance. Um, have, oh, I'm out of time. Okay, I, I was just kind of wondering about, and I'll let one of my colleagues pick it up, I'm out of time, but what about folks that don't have insurance? What do you expect your feasibility study to even show? Um, but I'll, I'm done, I'm out of time, thank you. I think my colleague will pick it up. Uh, Council Member Scamble Everett. And I'll, I can be that colleague, so. Um, Thank you for your report this evening, and, and thank you for what you've said, what you've laid out here for us for regarding the integrated health care. I think it's very interesting. Um, I'd like to get a better understanding of scope, and then I'd like to shift to the insurance question that Council Member Sims asked. Um, do we know about how many individual users there are for 911? Not how many calls, how many individual users? We do have a good sense of those that overuse the system, but not necessarily, you know, a case by case or one by one. Um, so for us, the top 10 users of our services uh, equate to about 250 calls a year. The t say that again, the top 10 users of service place, each of them place 250 calls a year or uh, collectively? Overall, two, collectively, the, the top 10 users are 250 calls a year. So 25 calls, that's a call every other week figure. Yes. Okay. Um, and then shifting to the interesting question of insurance, I, I would be interested in knowing how that would work. Um, how, how do you set an amount to bill someone for that? I would be interested in knowing what you've seen in other cities with these services and whether or not they've been successful in getting that set up and how it works. Well, I, as I stated in my presentation, of all the programs like this that operate in the state, not a single one has figured this piece out. Um, there are federal laws that are being adjusted um, from Medicare, Medicaid, others uh, that may be mirrored within the state. Um, it is a very complicated thing, medical billing and insurance. Um, so we're not looking at, um, you know, billing everybody that we go to, but if they have the capability for insurance uh, that would potentially cover some of the services we're providing, that's what this feasibility study needs to evaluate. Um, so, you know, knowing what we know, and knowing that no one else has figured it out, and there's a lot of really smart people working on this, um, I'm going to say that this may take us a, a while to figure out, but um, what we're looking to do is seeing if there's anything we can do to help make it more sustainable than just outpouring of general fund or ED lit dollars to provide this service. Okay. Well, I bet we'll be the first to figure it out if, we, if it gets figured out. So um, I'll hold some additional questions for the second round, and I'll finish up then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Uh, Chief Moore, you were kind enough to take me on a tour after the flood of June and 21 as to the uh, station that got completely destroyed and you've had to since relocate. Can you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are about moving forward and a replacement of that particular facility? I can. Uh, I knew this question was going to come up and I appreciate you asking it. 
Um, since the flood, we have evaluated 42 properties to potentially see about relocating. Um, it's also important to realize that the model that Vic showed um, all of you in his presentation is something that was just recently made available to us, which means we are now also uh, evaluating the feasibility of going back into that structure if it's completely demolition, remodeled, making sure there's no mold or mildew issues. Um, so where I'm at now, uh, we are waiting on that feasibility study for that station. If it is a viable option, it would be a lot less expensive to rehab a, the old station than it would be to purchase new property and start a new construction. Um, so, but we do have two very good options on the table and obviously for uh, a lot of reasons, we're not gonna discuss potential locations at this point, but if we do get into that, then we will engage with council and with uh, community members to make sure that we're making good choices and everyone is properly informed. Great, thank you. Other questions from council members? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, I, I'm very interested in the um, mobile integrated healthcare program, and I'm I'm excited that the the two um, staff members have been hired and will be ready to go soon. Um, and pleased to see that there are two more positions in the budget. Um, can you talk a little bit about the qualifications you look for for people um, employees in this program? Absolutely. So at phase one of this, uh, the mobile integrated healthcare, we were looking for emergency medical technicians. Um, we are looking uh, with state recommendations to upgrade that to a paramedic program. Um, but currently right now we were looking for EMTs. We also look for people with strong backgrounds in social working um, or that had helped in the hospital system, helped get uh, advocates, patient advocates. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that our two candidates uh, fit they're, they're almost the, the unicorns that didn't exist uh, in this new evolving uh, career field that we're, we're helping create here. Um, so we do have an EMT that is coming from a very strong court advocate background. Uh, we also have an EMT uh, with a lot of field experience that is pursuing her paramedic. Uh, so both of those together, uh, these are really great candidates and they have already hit it off even though they haven't started here and they're, they're really excited about it and so are we about starting this new program. That's great. And what kind of vehicle do they use or will they use? Um, it will come down to what equipment they need. Currently, we have it uh, set out to have one of the electric vehicles. If it turns out they need to carry more equipment, then we may have to upgrade to an SUV. Um, almost no program that I'm aware of uh, around uses anything larger than an SUV. Um, and again, uh, we also have some other newer vehicles that are becoming. They are the small uh, sport utility types. So accessing people into the parks or on the B line or some of the homeless encampments, some of those other areas, those very small vehicles may be the most appropriate choice. Okay, but for now you're planning to use an electric vehicle and then kind of see how it evolves? That is correct. Okay. And by electric vehicle, like a passenger vehicle? Like, yes, yeah. uh, a Chevy Volt is what, what we've ordered and what should be delivered hopefully soon. Um, and it is uh, fully electric, not even, uh, it's not even a hybrid, it's a full electric vehicle. Okay, well, thank you so much. Very good, Any other first round questions here? No, we'll, we'll turn to the second round. Council Member Scambulleri. Yes, thank you. Um, continuing with the integrated healthcare and the two new staff, um, I'm interested in how they will work in concert or how they'll collectively work together um, for example, with the police social workers and with the other staff that we have embedded throughout public safety in the city, um, how will we coordinate all of that activity? Does all that flow through dispatch? What kind of training are we provided for providing for dispatch as they take on, as they adjust to these new positions? Could you talk about that? I can, and I know Chief Decoff will talk about uh, some other adjustment at that dispatch to help with that. Um, but essentially, uh, there are a lot of services coming online uh, between last year, the police, uh, I think for several years, they've been running their social work program. And what we're trying to do is find the, the gap. And for our department, the gap is uh, those that need medication management, need uh, management of chronic conditions. Um, so you'll find some people that um, if someone would just follow up with them about their medicines, they would not uh, you know, have a medical emergency. Uh, we also want to look at the, again, pre and post 911. So after a, a police, de police officer, firefighter, uh, someone goes out like on an overdose, that we're following up and making sure that they're getting continuity of care after the overdose. 
Um, so really our, our niche in this is working with the social workers on case management. You know, they've got a really good thumb on the pulse of, of what's going on. Um, there are other community uh, providers that are bringing on crisis teams for those in acute uh, mental crisis. And ours is gonna be in that, that before and after and just trying to make sure that we're, we're doing the medical side. Um, so that, that's kind of where our program fits into this big, big pool of uh, resources that are out there. And again, this may evolve. So as we start working together with the social workers, we may find this fits our tooling a little bit better than theirs, and we may find it the other way. Uh, but what I can say is we've already started that. Uh, they were involved in the hiring process um, for these positions, and we've already had meetings with them about how they can integrate, how they can work together, and how we can do this and provide this service at a, a much better uh, place. And as far as your question about dispatch, um, I'm gonna let Chief Decoff talk about that. That is his department to run, but we are making adjustments at dispatch to start reviewing how, how this 911 calls are handled. That's very helpful, thank you. Any other second round questions? Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, Chief Moore, um, and first of all, uh, uh, some of the questions that I might ask of you or discussions having to do with diversity, um, trust me, is something that I feel about every department throughout the city. Um, and so I don't want you to think I'm picking on BFD or something like that. We've had these discussions before. Um, but for an example, if, and I know BPD doesn't, I'm sorry, BFD does not. But for an example, if you had 1,000 employees and the goal was 7% diversity, then you're looking at 70 people out of that 1,000. And that would include all BIPOC um, population members. So, uh, and I understand with the, the challenges we're having of even hiring uh, entry level people um, at this point, I understand that. But again, I'll start inquiring more with almost every department over time with some of my questionings because we hear it all the time. I mean, it's, and I believe it's a goal and I know we work hard, um, but I'd like to start to see some results at some point um, throughout this process. Um, with the integrated health care, and you mentioned a feasibility study, um, is part of what you expect to find through this study, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to figure out is how much of that integrated health care would be considered basic city services. And if that's the case, are those the people who don't get billed through their insurance? Um, so I'm sure that's what you're looking at through these. And to me, that, uh, appears that could be an equity issue in and of itself. Um, you, you have any thoughts on that? I do. Um, so first and foremost, we're not gonna withhold service from anybody, whether or not they, they could or could not pay. This feasibility study is only to see if there is a portion of the cost that could be re reimbursed to the city to help make it more sustainable. Uh, but this is a service that, that we intend on providing um, as a city service and the potential for reimbursement is only to help uh, make it more sustainable. So uh, we would not bill if someone can't pay, we're not gonna deny care. That, that's not the world we're getting into. We're just trying to see if someone does have insurance, could it potentially be reimbursable? And again, this is not an easy uh, task to complete as no one in this state has figured out this component of it. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you, any other uh, second round questions? All right, we're ready for some public comment. Um, Mr. Lucas, uh, I'll remind the public that you can send a note in chat, you can send an email to the council office, and so you're able to make a comment on the fire department budget in the presentation tonight. Is there anybody in the uh, hall that wishes to make comment? You can queue up doesn't look like it. Um, Mr. Lucas? Yes, I'll just uh, remind members of the uh, public on Zoom that if you'd like to comment, you can use the raise hand feature to indicate you'd like to speak. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab, or send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll just wait for one few seconds here. Any response? Not that I see. Okay, I think we'll move to final comment. Um, council members, would you 
Anyone like to make a final comment on the budget of the fire department? Mr. Sims. Thank you. Um, first of all, I am, am very, very proud of our public safety um, personnel, uh, BFD, BPD, and so I'll, I'll just say that. I'm very, very proud, and I think that part of my responsibility is to do what we can to provide funding um, so that it is a, a community good and that it provides for basic city services. Um, you know, protect and serve, if you will, and take care of, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and it's good that we have revenue streams to consider uh, many of these requests that we're hearing this year. Um, so I will ask some questions, because part of what I think sometimes is, I understand there's goals and there's some looking into the future, but sometimes I think, what problem are we trying to solve? Do, uh, uh, and that's kind of the way I think. Is there something out there that we need to do this to solve a problem? Or, or how are we looking at it? Um, and obviously all that takes finances. So um, I will support or, or plan to support uh, BFD's budget. Um, and we'll have more talks and more answers and questions as we move forward. Um, but uh, that's where I am tonight, and thank you again for the presentation and taking the time to indulge me in some of these questions and discussion. Thank you. Um, any other final comments from uh, council members? I'd just like to say thank you very much for uh, all you do uh, for the city and everyone, and um, thank you for the presentation. Are we ready for a due pass? Uh, okay. Uh, Deputy Clark Crosley, will you please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Sims? Yes. Scambaleri? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Pass. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Pass. Ann Volan? Yes. Thank you very much. By my count, that is 602. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Moore, and appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, we're going to turn to the Bloomington Police Department with Chief Decoff. And you're on, sir. Good evening, Council. My name is Mike Decoff. I'm the Police Chief for the City of Bloomington. The mission of the Bloomington Police Department is to safeguard life and property while respecting diversity, encouraging civility, solving problems, and maintaining a high standard of individual integrity and professionalism. I want to thank you for the opportunity tonight to present the 2023 uh, Police Department budget request. I also want to thank you for your past continued support for the men and women of the Bloomington Police Department. We've been through some tough times the last several years, and the council support has been a lot to us. The police department is authorized 105 sworn officers and 62 non-sworn employees. Uh, currently, uh, of the 105 sworn author officers authorized, we have 81 employed, and we have 72 available. And when I talk about the availability of officers, we have one on military leave, two um, waiting on academy dates, two on, off on long-term sick or injury, and four in our field training officer program. That leaves us with 24 open sworn positions. Talk a little bit about that. Um, officer shortages are a national problem. You can see every day in news stories across this country where police departments are struggling to hire police officers. They're struggling to retain police officers. Um, that is uh, a problem that we, too, share with other law enforcement agencies. Um, I was at a recent uh, Indiana mayor's conference, and that seemed to be the talk across 
uh, Indiana with these various mayors of their communities too struggling to hire police officers and retain the ones that they have. Um, that is one reason why you will see in this budget request um, alternative type positions like our community service specialists uh, to help uh, relieve the load on sworn police officers so that we can concentrate on more serious type stuff. I will tell you that we just had over the weekend, um, this past weekend, a hiring process where we had 28 people apply or show up for the testing. And so we are in the process of, of that hiring process and we have four currently certified people that are in background investigation. So we are hoping that we will be able to add some people um, in the near future. This is just kind of another breakdown uh, of the 78 sworn officers authorized in the patrol division. We have 54 available in our detective division. We are authorized 16 uh, detectives. We have 13 available. The administrative division has five. We have those five. In our civilian employees, we are authorized 62 and we have 56 available. We have two openings in our community service for, for community service specialists and the rest are openings in our dispatch center. Talk a little bit about some accomplishments for 2022. Uh, we recently, um, actually at the beginning of August, hired uh, Director of Civ Civilian Operations. Uh, this person is over our dispatch and records now. Um, they are trying to work to coordinate those two divisions so that we can work more efficiently and effectively. Uh, but one of the main responsibilities that we will have this, this new position, this person uh, pursue is accreditation of our dispatch center. The police department is CALEA certified and we are hoping to have our dispatch center CALEA certified in the next few years. We also hired an additional data analyst this year. Um, we receive a lot of requests for data. Uh, we also use that data to help us uh, refine our patrol uh, districts and our strategies. So having a second person in that role has been quite helpful um, as we as we continue to work with fewer and fewer officers. Uh, another accomplishment is we had some retirements. Uh, Joe Qualters was the deputy chief, retired in July. Um, we appointed a new deputy chief, Scott Oldham, who is back here today. And we also appointed a new captain of operations, Mick Williams. We also, because those people were promoted, had uh, some uh, two lieutenant promotions and two sergeant promotions as well. Touch on some major, the major 2023 initiatives in this budget request. Uh, we're requesting funding for a joint police fire recruiting specialist. Um, talk a little bit about that. I see this as a really important position. We have 24 openings. Um, we struggle to hire, it's a full-time job anymore. That usually falls under the uh, administrative captain's responsibilities, um, but he has other duties besides just hiring. So we are requesting this position um, as joint position to share with fire as well, um, because uh, hiring is such an integral part to what we need to be doing. And, and we do not have the specialization to, to do that, to, re to recruit people, to find people. Um, and so, uh, hiring a professional that has that experience, we believe is um, very important since we have so many openings. We wanna focus on retention, <clears throat> retention of our current employees and on the next slide, I'll go into uh, the incentive packages that we have been uh, that ha put in place to help us do that. Um, we wanna ask for three additional new community service specialists. As I mentioned earlier, those positions help a lot with what we do. They take approximately 6% of our call volume Every year they work most accidents. They take minor non-criminal calls. They take calls where there's no suspect, no investigation needed. They help with traffic direction and tows. They do extra patrols and they also help us at community events. Um, and lastly on uh, our request for new personnel, we would like to hire an additional so social worker that we will assign to Central Dispatch. Um, other departments around the country have done this. We're looking at this as a way to divert calls before we actually have to even dispatch a police officer. We see this position also uh, not only helping the Bloomington Police Department, but dispatch also dispatches for the Sheriff's Office, dispatches for fire. As the fire chief mentioned, they have repeat callers, so we're hoping that this position will help 
uh, relieve some of the calls for sworn personnel, and we can take the opportunity to direct these people to services before uh, a police officer or a firefighter would need to respond. So I mentioned uh, just a minute ago about our retention initiatives. Uh, on, the, on the screen are some of the things that we are doing. We are offering up to $18,000 in down payment assistance for homes purchased within the city. Uh, we do not currently have any officers taking advantage of that. Um, we are offering up to $750 for rental assistance for officers to live in the city. We have seven current employees who are taking advantage of that incentive. We have individual issue patrol vehicles for officers living in the city. We currently have 10 officers who live within the city limits who have a take-home car. Uh, we also have a $5,000 hiring bonus for lateral transfer officers and a $3,000 hiring bonus for all other applicants. Uh, we do not currently have anybody taking advantage of that because those are very new and we are hoping that with these, uh, we will be using some of that incentive money with the current people that we are in the process of trying to hire. Um, we also have referrals for officers who, if they find someone and they apply to the police department and we hire them, uh, those officers can receive a finder's fee for finding good quality applicants to apply with the department. So we have 16 goals uh, for 2022 divided into six categories. The categories listed are increasing community sense of safety, accreditation, data analysis to set crime reduction goals, central emergency dispatch, records and administration, financial and maintenance. I'm gonna to just touch on a few of those tonight. Um, under increasing the community's sense of safety, uh, the goal was to reduce overall crimes, inc including burglaries, robberies, and thefts by 3% in 2022 compared to 2021 levels. Well, we won't know the results of that until the end of the year because we're mid-year, but I can report that um, we reduced crime, overall crime by 9% um, in, uh, tw uh, in 2021 from the 2020 levels. So that's, that's a significant um, reduction, but I will remind you that we were during COVID. Um, many of the bars where we get a lot of calls to were not open. So um, we are hopeful though we can maintain still a decrease in crime, but um, life is returning back to normal and our call volume is up. So we will, we will see how that, that plays out. Another one of our updates for 2022 is we continue to emphasize de-escalation and less lethal force options. Um, and we have instituted a training program called ICAT through the Police Executive Research Forum. It's an evidence-based de-escalation program that officers go through. Um, we exhaust other opportunities before resorting to force. And, and um, this enhanced training um, is used by most CALEA agencies um, it has been, it's an evidence-based program. The University of Cincinnati studied uh, the Louisville Police Department and their efforts in using ICAT and found significant decreases in the use of force incidences and overall injuries. Um, we also are continuing to um, institute the state mandates in, in uh, 2022, I believe it was this year in the General Assembly, they, they passed police, some police reform measures along with 2021, and we are um, uh, within those state mandates, um, which those also include uh, decertification and penalties for officers if they um, violate use of force policies and turn off body cameras during, uh, during certain incidences. Talk a little bit about accreditation. Uh, this year we were re-accredited for the first time. Uh, accreditation is a four-year a, a program and standard, and we went through uh, the national process of reviewing all 188 standards. They reviewed our policies and procedures. They conducted community forums for people to comment. They conducted interviews with department personnel, elected officials, and other community stakeholders, and we did receive uh, reaccreditation for another four-year term uh, this, uh, this summer, this past July. So some 2023 budget goals under increasing the community sense of safety. One of the things that we're really going to work on is trying to reduce the number of gun crimes that are committed in our community. Um, a couple of things, um, if you remember 
Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the mayor and I and the deputy mayor and Beverly Callender Armstrong, the director of the state of uh, Community Family and Resources, participated in a roundtable discussion on, on gun violence. Um, some of the things that we are looking at um, first is enhanced forensic investigations at crime scenes. What this involves is uh, more DNA analysis of evidence that we find at crime scenes. Uh, we're processing uh, casings and bullets that we might find at a crime scene to see if it's been used in any other crimes, not only locally but across the state. Um, we're doing a more comprehensive canvassing of areas looking for video evidence on cameras that may not be city owned such as ring doorbell cameras or private, private businesses who might have security cameras. And we are now routine, routinely getting assistance from the alcohol, tobacco and firearms on tracking guns used at crime scenes to determine ownership and to, to determine how a suspect came into possession of that firearm. We believe that these will link other crimes, other gun crimes, and will lead us to suspects so that we can pursue um, charging these people with the, with the gun crimes that they committed. Uh, another one of the things that we're paying particular attention to is red flag filings. Um, and when I talk about red flag, you may be familiar with those red flag laws, which are um, in Indiana, it's called the Jake Layard Law. Um, those are used to uh, check on people who are dangerous to themselves or dangerous to others and should not have a firearm. Um, with Indiana's uh, basic deregulation of handgun permits, that is something that is, is even more important. Um, with the prolification of, of firearms that are available, we want to make sure that um, no person who has been um, judged that they should not possess one has one. Lastly, we're going to target violent repeat offenders. A substantial number of people involved in shootings are repeat offenders. We are going to focus on these individuals and those violent offenders who have active warrants. Um, we see all too, too often the number of times that we respond to a, a violent crime or a gun crime that it involves someone that we may have had contact with on an earlier incident. And so we are going to pay close attention to that and do what we can to make sure that they do not commit any more gun crimes. So another 23 budget goal under increasing community sense of safety. Um, as I talked earlier, funding the police fire recruiting specialists, hiring the three additional community service specialists, and hiring the police social worker for dispatch. We will continue in 23 our accreditation. Every year, assessors from the uh, uh, Commission on Law Enforcement Accreditation um, randomly choose 54 standards to review. And so it is an ongoing process to keep those standards, those policies, those procedures updated um, as we don't know which ones they will check to see if we are in compliance. So that will continue to be a 23 goal next year. One of the goals in 23 also in dispatch, as I talked about, is hiring the police social worker. Um, again, as I stated, it is to help um, triage calls before we would have to actually send a, a police officer to those and refer people to other services. Um, also, as a 911 review committee, um, we are looking at um, putting together a group of individuals to basically review the calls that come into dispatch um, and to determine what type of response is appropriate. Um, for instance, we, we frequently get, um, well, probably not so much anymore, but we used to get like bat calls. Somebody would call and say, I have a bat in my house. We would send an officer to try to get the bat out. Um, we don't do that anymore because obviously we don't have the resources to do that, but that's the type of activity that this committee will do is they will look at the types of calls that are coming into dispatch to try to see how we can um, preserve our resources for more serious things, yet still be able to respond to those out of the ordinary type of calls that we get um, to make sure that we send the right resources on each and every call. 23 budget goal under administration, financial and maintenance. We are continuing the planning process for the construction of a new police headquarters. Um, we are currently in, our, in the due diligence period. There's been um, discussions, and I'm sure you're all aware of, 
uh, the potential purchase for the CFC side of showers. Um, this is something that we are uh, very excited about getting a new location. Our current facility is, is small. Um, if you've been in it, you, you know that. You can tell we've carved office space out of, out of storage units. Um, so we are in desperate need of a new facility. Um, we also sustained um, considerable flood damage last year. Uh, unlike the fire department, we repaired that damage and we're still in our building, um, but it still leaks. We still, we still have um, water that pops up in the basement when we get a heavy rain. So um, we have hired an architect to estimate our or to evaluate our space needs and look at the total project costs and eva evaluate the future potential. Um, our architect is also consulting with a specific public safety architecture firm who specializes in police facilities. So we're hopeful that um, at the end of the due diligence period, we'll be able to make the appropriate decisions on what we need as far as a new uh, police department. So 2023 budget highlights category one personnel, 18,891,242 is requested. Uh, this is an increase of 1,590,598 um, from 2022. Uh, the, the majority of this increase is due to contractual raises um, for the FOP contract that takes effect in 2023. Um, also the, the uh, new positions and the non-union raises. Category two is supplies, $836,014 is requested. Uh, this is an increase of 270,633 from 22. Um, the bulk of this is inflationary increases and body camera and car camera uh, storage costs. We've, we've increased the number of, uh, uh, the amount of storage and unfortunately the price has gone up. Category three, other services and charges, 2,717,273 is requested. This is an increase of 1,073,525 from 2022. Uh, the majority of this, um, approximately 780,000, is debt service for the new building. Um, the rest of the increases are uh, due to fuel, fuel cost and inflation. And category four, there's a request, our request is 1,867,477. Um, this is an increase of 430,127. Um, and this is mostly due to inflation and um, our, our firing range overhaul. It's it's uh, it's its 15-year maintenance overhaul, um, and that is about a $200,000 $200, um, expenditure. So total request for our 2023 budget is 24 million. $312,006, that includes general fund public safety lit, the ED lit, police education, training dispatch, and $10 in enhanced access. This is the overall uh, last few year comparison. Um, the 2023 budget request is an 8% increase over last year's budget. With that, again, I would thank you for your consideration and our request, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Dikoff. Uh, Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Chief Dikoff. Um, so looking at the uh, number of available officers, sworn officers uh, of 72, um, that's not really much changed in, since last year, is it? No. Is, okay. So, that says to me, well, maybe one assumption would be they're probably, um, we are probably short on shifts because yes. of that, as we have been. And we are probably uh, having officers work overtime in order yes. to, to compensate. So we, we, we haven't uh, fundamentally improved the situation uh, um, in terms of recruitment incentives. Uh, even though uh, we, we did deploy a $5,000 uh, pay increase. What will be the base pay after the contractual raises? What will be the starting base pay to you? I wish I could tell you that, but okay. I don't remember what it is. Sorry. Is it, it, if memory serves, it was 50, 56000 60000 Is that right? I, I'm looking at Indianapolis. They have a starting salary of 61000 66. Uh, the deputy mayor tells me it's 66 something. 66,000 will be yes. the base pay? 
Okay. All right. Uh, well, that's that's uh, uh, somewhat favorable. So, uh, looking at incentives and looking at ways in which we could provide incentives, uh, you know, I realize that non-sworn officers can be valuable community service specialists. I I think that the I, I'm very partial to the police social worker at dispatch. I think that makes sense. But the community service specialists, three of them, how many do we have already? How we many? are authorized six, and we have two openings um, in, in, that, in that area. So will it bring us up to six total? No, it'll, the three additional bring us up to nine total. Nine total. Even though we're, so we're authorized for six, we have nine. We will have nine if this is... Yes. Okay. So that seems to me much higher than, you know, what's needed with a 6% call volume that they respond to. So one of the things we're hoping with the additional uh, community service specialists is to actually expand the hours. They work from approximately uh, 7 in the morning to 8 p.m. at night, and we still are, are busy, you know, with, with calls that, that they might be able to take until around midnight. So we're hoping that with the additional... Uh, positions we will be able to expand the number of hours that that program runs. Um, again, the hope is that um, there are a lot of minor calls that they take, which free up the officers to do more. Um, so that that is that is the goal and the intent with adding those additional positions. Yes, I understand. My concern is raising that number from 72 to closer to 105 as soon as we can get there. So my time's so, so just to kind of follow up with that, we're, we're the incentives are relatively new and um, we have not had much success as we do hiring processes getting um, high numbers of people to apply. And so um, discussions we had as we were going into budget was what can we do to do that? And that's where the idea of hiring a recruiting specialist um, came in. There are headhunters that hunt, hunt for people all over in all kinds of jobs. That's not anything we've really ever um, experimented with. And so we're hopeful that with the incentive packages that we have, with the recruiting specialists that we hope to, to hire, um, that we will be able to, to do something with that. Um, we are also, um, we have funding where um, if this position is, is approved, we might start it early um, so that because we, we are terribly understaffed and we need to we need to try to fill those positions as quickly as we can. And so um, conversations that the deputy mayor and I have had, um, we we are talking about hiring someone um, in the interim until we can hire a full time person to help us try to recruit more people for employment. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful, uh, D Deputy Mayor. Did you? Um, yeah, can if, I chime in a little bit? Well, please, yeah. yeah. Thank you. In, in regards to the, uh, in, in regards to the recruiter, um, we did a lot of research around the uh, the country, uh, knowing that this is a, a national trend where uh, the young, this younger crowd, this younger group of uh, folks, uh, they only stay in a job for on average two years. And so that is, that's across the board. We, we've noticed a pattern that they will still be looking for jobs after taking a job. So the solution to that is to have a recruiter. We should be recruiting all the time. Similar to the, the armed forces, um, we need to be recruiting constantly because keeping people long term like we used to, I mean, yes, we want that. We want people to stay. but. Uh, a, a lot of them are, uh, that's just not the trend for this younger generation. Um, hopefully you, you bring them in, you bring them in, uh, they like it here, uh, they may leave, but then they come back because of the experience that they had. So uh, we, we've got we've to adapt. We can't do what we were doing before. Bloomington's a great community. Uh, we've got a great police force. Uh, we're, we're working on, uh, got gr excellent, equ excellent equipment. We're working on our building. Um, so at the end of the day, I think we're really sellable, but we, we have to be realistic about how long we're gonna be able to keep this new generation. Thank you, I appreciate uh, 
more clarity on the recruiting specialist. Thank you very Thank much. You uh, Council Member Scambaluri. Yes. What? Sorry, oh, Sue. Oh, okay. My sorry. My my bad. But the two Susans. So, um, the Kalia report that you referenced for reaccreditation is yes. that available online? I did a quick look and I couldn't find it. Um, we're I... still waiting on getting the final report oh, okay. um, from Kalia. Once once we get that, we will publish that online. Okay. And can you share that with this body yes. as well? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a spend a little bit more time on the incentives we've been offering too. We spend a ton of time talking about that the last couple of years and how to grow that. And I'm curious if you feel we're offering the right incentives. Um, it, it, since we're not moving the needle very much, is it simply a national issue and, and other people are offering these same incentives too? Yeah, so what I have seen. we rethink what we've offered? Yeah, what I've seen across the country is um, I, I think it's becoming a kind of a one-upsman ship type of game where I've seen some agencies offering, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar signing bonuses. And so um, you know, we I I believe we are offering the right incentives. Um, it's just you know, it's a it's a constant struggle that every police department is dealing with is trying to hire people. Um, I can't think of any of my colleagues around the state or chiefs that I know around the country that are fully staffed. And so it, it really is a national problem. Um, you know, I, I get um, all kinds of, of uh, daily police briefing type emails and it's, it's always talking about, you know, strategies to find quality police officers, strategies to keep police officers. So it's not something that, it's not only us, it's everybody around us. Um, everybody in the state and everybody in the nation is struggling with this. So I, I think that we have, um, we're doing the right types of incentives, but again, I don't know that we're doing the best job of trying to find police officers, and that's again why the recruiting specialist we think is, is important, mm -hmm. um, because I don't have a, recruiting hiring background. Uh, Captain Pedigo doesn't have a recruiting hiring background. It's just something that somebody has always done in the police department, but obviously we're, we struggle. So we're hopeful that having someone who has, that's what they do, and having the incentive package that we have, having the, the new contract that has a substantial raise, we're hoping that that will help us draw a lot more applicants and help us fill those positions a lot quicker. And it sounds like the intentional recruiting will help us more than entering the arms race of well, you know, bonuses. Well, it, it really perhaps. has become a full-time job. When I was a captain and I, I was doing hiring, we did a hiring process once a year, but we would have 100 people show up. So we could have a list of 20 people on that list to hire from. That's, those days are long gone. We're, like I said, we had 28 that showed up um, Saturday, I think we had, I think 42 had RSVP'd said they would be there. Um, and, and already we're down to 21 because of that 28, some of them didn't pass the physical agility test, which is mandated by the state, or the written test. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, and again, I'm not willing to lower our standards for hiring. And so we're just constantly always in this hiring phase. Um, and so we're hoping that having this recruiter with the incentive packages that we have, the new contract coming in in 23, that that will be an attractive package for someone who wants to be a police officer. Great, thank you. I have some second round questions about social work, our social workers, but I'll come back to it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Uh, going back to the recruiter, this, this individual is gonna have a tough row to hoe because obviously other places throughout the state are wanting to recruit too. So this kind of brings me back to the whole issue of our, our new headquarters, our new building. Obviously I think, and it's gonna take a while to do that, it's gonna take a while to rebuild the, the culture if you will, it's gonna take a while to rebuild a lot of things to get those numbers back up to the 105 that we actually need. So my concern has to do with the new headquarters. I understand you're still in 
pretty squalid conditions right now following the flood, and it wasn't a great place to begin with, you now are expanding your programs where you're going to need space. So if I could just ask you, if you had an ideal uh, picture in your mind, what could we do in addition to the incentives and hiring a talent acquisition specialist to make the headquarters a place where it would be a recruiting tool? Sure. So, uh, you know, these are, these are things that I've looked at, um, you know, uh, the deputy mayor referenced the fact that um, people who are entering, you know, the employment market these days don't stay at jobs very long. And so um, one of the things that we've always tried to do is we've always tried to maintain top notch equipment. Um, and so um, we are, we are, we are there. We, we have started, um, you know, a take home car program. That is something that um, we didn't have for many, many years where most police agencies in Indiana did. Um, so we're, we've, we've made strides and taken steps to fix those things. Um, you know, a new, a new police headquarters, that can be a recruiting tool. People will look and see what types of investments the community is making. And if they see that we are, we are investing in, you know, a new building, um, that also will help us with recruiting. And so, you know, that's why this due diligence period with showers is so important because um, it is, it is a, uh, um, it has a lot more space than we currently have. So that is a, that is a really nice, uh, attractive part of it. Um, you know, we, we struggle with parking at our current facility. Um, there's a parking garage right there. So how we, how we design this, how we look at, um, you know, the parking, the, the access, how we do all of that um, is something that I think people who are looking for employment will look at to see, you know, are, are we investing in, in those, those facilities that help them do their job? Um, so it, it is really important. And so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take, it's, it is going to take some time. It's going to take some time as we evaluate it. Um, and then, um, you know, it'll take time to, to remodel it. Um, you know, we've, we've had, when we started at 4th and Walnut, we were there for many, many years. Um, when I got hired at BPD a very long time ago, um, we had just moved into the, the basement of the Justice Building. Um, you know, I look at that space today thinking there is no way we could operate out of that space. It's just way too small. Then in 98, we moved to our current facility, which was originally designed to be a police department back in the 60s. The police department never moved in. When we finally did, we still spent a million dollars to remodel it in 1998. Um, but it was, at that time, served our needs quite well. We continue to grow. We continue to um, need more space. We've added, uh, you know, a training center down south. We've added a training center annex. We've added a substation at um, Switchyard Park. So we are continuing to grow. That is something that recruits look at. They look at, we have, a, we, have a tr we have two training centers. We have a major storage area down there. Those are things that benefit new officers. We have a brand new weight room at one of our, at one of our training facilities. That is something that a, a new recruit would look at or a new applicant would look at as, what is, what is the department willing to invest in me? So we're taking those steps. Um, it's just, again, everyone is struggling to hire. Um, so I'm hoping that we will catch a break and, and be able to hire some people to reduce that number of, of open positions. Thank you. I'm at my time, but I'll have more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any other first round questions? Uh, Ms. Piedmont Smith. Yes, uh, thank you, Captain. Um, Chief Dekoff. Um I had a question about the downtown resource officers. Uh, I noticed currently uh, we're down to two um, sworn officers who are in those those roles. Um, is this a, a downsizing of the DRO program, or is that just a factor of not having enough officers overall? It's the latter. We just don't have the people to to fill those positions. Okay. Yeah. Because those are very valuable. I know I have to build those relationships with uh, yeah. the community. Um, and then my other question was about um, the deployment of the CERT team and the CERT vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, I looked on uh, the Be, Be Clear portal, which points you to the Socrata portal, and the most recent report of the use of that team and that vehicle was from May 2021. 
So um, can you, I don't know if you know off the top of your head or can provide us the information of in the, like in the last 12 months, how often it's been used? Yeah, I would have, I'll have to look at that. It, um, I haven't looked at the uh, Be Clear portal recently, so I don't know, I don't know how updated it is. So I'll, I'll check into that and get you that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, other for second round questions? Did you have another one? No. Okay. Council Member Volan. Oh, oh. up here. Oh, Council Member Volan. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chief Deacon, thanks for the presentation. Just one question. Um, how many square feet roughly does the police department have now, and how many square feet is the department shooting for? Uh, it's, it's got 20,000. Uh, half of that is in the basement, the current police station. Um, the uh, CFC side of showers is 64,000 square feet. Okay, but I mean, that would be a combined police and fire headquarters, 64,000 right? square feet, I'm sorry. And, and uh, 10,000 square feet above ground and 10,000 square feet in the basement at the current uh, a police station. Right. So, but uh, the fire department would also need some of that space, is that not right? That, that's true. Uh, however, the fire station currently is in less than 2,000 square feet as far as the administration portion of Station 1. So what you're saying is uh, while it could be a headquarters for the fire department, uh, it's largely going to be the all-in-one headquarters for the police department, or do you plan some additional sites? I mean, you already have your first uh, substation down at Switchyard Park. So, like, it, will it that, that will it, does the police department really need 60,000 square feet, or do they need more? No, they won't need 60,000 square feet, but at least 30,000 is 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 I think what at least 30,000 is what we're aiming for on the low end. So in other words, what you're saying is this isn't just uh, a place to relocate public safety agencies, it's a, a place to expand into. In other words, you, you're going to grow into it. It's not going to provide space problems for a long time to come. Absolutely. That's the goal. That's why, it, that's, that's why we so. had to, had to uh, at least pursue it. Uh, it's proximity uh, to what we already have. Sometimes you have to, you have to double down on what you got. Um, and at yeah, yeah, I'm not questioning that at all. Yeah. I'm just curious. I, I, my concern was the other way. Was would it be enough? How much space? In other words, uh, uh, Chief Dickoff has said, you know, when we uh, uh, moved in in, the, in '98, it was built for the '60s. We had to expand it. So, you know, our youth. Uh, we we talk about the fire engines and CBU with a hundred year replacement cycle and so on. Um, you know, are you thinking about this next headquarters as a 50-year so, uh, so, or a 20-year project? So that's, that's some of the conversations that we're starting to have with the architect and the um, uh, public safety architect is um, they have experience in evaluating that. And so um, I've had one initial meeting with them to discuss space needs, and I'm sure I'll have uh, more in the next um, several weeks. We're going to be very interested in what some of your uh, thoughts are on that. Uh, last question, I know my time is out. Does that include a kind of any kind of jail cells? No. Or a city jail? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Rello, second round. Thank you. Um, I don't know who to direct this question to, but I'm guessing maybe Controller Underwood, if he is uh, still present, um, but whomever. Uh, I'm wondering what the yearly percent increase in police salaries is as per the contract. Total or, or just uh, per year? Gotcha. Okay. The uh, first year was approximately, uh, it was, there was two different percentages. One was uh, for the upper level was over 12% and for the um, officers first class and senior police officers, it was over 13% for 2023. For 2023? Yes. Okay. And what is the duration of the contract? Uh, it was a four-year contract. Okay. And it was four just years. 
four years from what date? I forgot when it, it was. It starts this year, 2023. 2023, so, 2023, 2023, so 2027. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Uh-huh. That's helpful. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Deputy were you, Mayor. Were you also asking for the other years as well, or that's just the first year? The uh, well, I was mostly concerned about next year, th this coming year, uh, 2023. But yeah, could you do you have that information? Uh, Jeff, <laughs> are you back on? Sorry, controller Underwood, that controller. would be it. Uh, I can, look, I don't have that. Um, Mr. Post, my fingertips, I can. Oh. If you, get, you can go on next. If you want to keep going, I'll okay. log on and find uh, it real quick. You, you can look, answer the question, Mr. Like Post. Paul Post ahead. is here, and he may have that information. Hi, yep. Paul Post, FOP 88. Uh, next year is 13.17 uh, for officer first class, 12.67 for SPO, the senior police officer. Uh, for 24, it's 2.80% uh, for both of them. For 25, it's 2.9%. And for 2026, it's 3.0%. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Post. I really appreciate that inf information. Thank you. Other second round questions? Council Member Scambaluri. Yes, thank you. Um, Chief Tiefkoff, in the last several years, we've made some investments in police social workers. Could you share an update on that program, how well they're integrating into the department? Sure. What you're seeing. So we now have a total of three uh, police social workers. Um, that program has been um, extremely successful. We, uh, they have um, not only um, integrated into working with officers on calls, they also um, have started to do more um, officer wellness type activities. So they they do some, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it counseling sessions, but you know we deal with a lot of traumatic events, and so uh, they they um, set up sessions with people who, with officers who have been involved in those types of events to talk talk to them, talk through things. Um, they have monthly newsletters that they put out where each one of the social workers focuses on a specific area. Um, they have been really involved in. Um, uh, outreach efforts that we do. Um, they've been really involved in department activities. We, we recently um, rented out the um, Tivoli Theater in Spencer for a movie night, um, and they were involved in that um, where um, we encouraged officers and their families to show up and, and you know, just watch the movie. Um, they have really good popcorn there, by the way. Um, and so, so in that regard, it's been very successful. Um, Another thing that we've really um, done with that program is we are uh, contacted frequently from other agencies from around the country about our program. Uh, today there was a, uh, a social worker that showed up from State College PA to see what we do with our program to shadow our social workers. Um, Melissa Stone, who's the lead social worker, and I uh, returned um, in, in um, July from the Noble Conference, which is the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Um, we presented on police social worker programs at their national conference. Uh, we're doing it in Dallas in October at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. So it is something that is, is um, I believe, is, is kind of the, one of the new things in policing. Um, our next police social worker conference is the beginning of November. Uh, so this will be our second one that we've hosted, and it's a uh, half day, first day, full day, then half day, last day type uh, um, schedule. And so we have uh, people from all over the country that are not only presenting at this conference, but are also attending it. And so um, it's, it's been very successful. Um, the, the social workers are involved um, with our crisis negotiation team, which, which is kind of a different component um, with their background working with the officers when we do um, crisis negotiations, hostage negotiations, things like that. Um, they offer a little bit different perspective. So um, uh, Melissa, the lead social worker, is also now on the problem solving court team. So she works with the drug court uh, team. She works with the 
mental health court team and the veterans court team. And so that's, again, another component where we're, we're trying to make inroads in how we do uh, policing to, to reduce um, uh, people's contact with the criminal justice system. It's interesting. I, I was expecting you to talk about time savings for sworn officers and fewer calls that they necessarily had to make. But instead, what you're talking about is how they're making our existing work low, uh, how they're making our existing work richer and better. And, yeah, and I appreciate that. That's, I mean, there's so much that they do that, I, frankly, I kind of just forgot that part of it. But um, uh, they do. They, 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 um, they still work daily with officers on calls that they still have their own caseload where um, if, you know, it, it's someone that they had been involved with on a call previously that instead of that person calling 911, they now call the social workers to talk to. And so um, part of the presentation that we do at these conferences um, are case studies of people that were frequent callers to 911 and how now they don't call 911 anymore. And, and it, it takes just a little for someone who, who may have a mental health issue, uh, maybe not be on the right medications for them to get in contact with someone that can help them with that so that they don't call 911 and we don't have um, the police calls on those people. Thank you very much for that update. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Well, you know I'm a firm believer in how we've embedded the social workers and the community resource officers with the BPD. That does that comes with some controversy too. It does. You might want to address some of that, but I want to just kind of do some scenario work because there are clearly situations where you would not want to put your social workers or resource officers in harm's way. Let's let's take a quiet nights ordinance, okay? Breaking up a loud, aggressive party late at night. I mean, that is something clearly that you would want to still send in sworn officers to deal with. Uh, so can you just kind of give some other scenarios about other situations that you would first want to maybe send in sworn officers and then maybe if there's a need for follow-up, then sure. the social workers so would take we, over? We do not directly dispatch the social workers to any calls. Uh, the reason for that is um, because the types of calls that they might respond to um, can turn very volatile very quickly. And so we're not going to put their safety at risk by sending them first to a call without a, a sworn police officer uh, going first and checking that out. Um, they do a lot of follow-up. We refer a lot of people to the social workers, but we do not dispatch them directly. Um, and so, again, it's, it's, a, it's a big safety concern. The community service specialists, um, you know, they are, they are unarmed, they're not sworn officers, so we will not put them at risk by sending them to any type of call that we think um, could, could put them in harm's way. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned quiet nights and noise complaints. You know, those are classified as disturbance calls, um, and so they would not respond to those by themselves uh, as an initial response because you never know how those are going to turn out. We, you know, we've had officers show up on those calls, and and you know if you if you've ever been to a large party where you know there could be a hundred intoxicated people that can get it can get volatile very quick, and so we're not going to put um, those those non sworn positions um, in a situation where they could get hurt. And quiet nights are going to happen on the night shift, right? And so, do your community resource officers are they on all three shifts, or they, they, just they currently are not? But if we we get the 23 requests to add, we will expand the hours, um, probably to midnight. Um, but again, that is that is not the type of call that they would go to by themselves. In my remaining seconds, did I hear that there might be a gun buyback program in the works? That is something that we're pursuing, but um, we have to figure out how, um, uh, how we would do that because we can't use um, government money in a gun buyback program, so we would have to secure private funding to be able to do that. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you very much. Any other second round, second rounders? All right. Uh, Councilmember Rallo for round three. Just quickly, uh, I wondered about the use of the search vehicle in the past year. Uh, I, I seem to recall one with, with a, a possibly armed active shooter that was in maybe the, yeah, I think the in union. The past, that, I think in the past 12 months it's been used a couple of times. A couple of times. Yeah. Uh-huh. In, in, in four reasons. 
Like yeah, they we, we have policies in place that require us to do the threat matrix. The threat matrix is done every time um, that there is a request for that to make sure it, it meets um, our policies and what we've, what we've set forth in those policies as to its deployment. Okay. Thank you, Chief Dika. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, was there? My colleague, uh, uh, Count, uh, Council President Sandberg, referred to a bomb threat that occurred at Target. Was that your your force must have dealt with that? Yeah, we we responded to that. We had um, uh, the the person who um, did that then um, decided to, to start to harm themselves. So we took that person into custody and got them in, to the hospital to get checked out. But we also had the assistance of I believe it was the Indiana State Police um, bomb squad to come and check to make sure that it, it to see what it was, and it turned out not to be a bomb. But that was yesterday at the mall. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Appreciate right. that information. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we're done with uh, council member questions. Uh, now it's time for a public comment. Uh, anyone in the in the hall wish to to speak? You can line up. Um, otherwise, if you are online, um, you can. Uh, use the raise hand function, you can send a note in chat, and you could also, if you'd like, send an email to council office. And Mr. Lucas, what do we see? I do have one message uh, from Sam Dove who has a comment. Uh, haven't received the message yet, but uh, while I uh, hopefully wait for that here shortly, um, if there are members of the public that want to comment, uh, you can find the raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. And if you're not able to locate that, you can send a comment or a request to comment uh, through the chat. And I don't see any messages coming in now. If I receive any after we close public comment, I will be sure to pass those on to council members. All right, let's come back to council for final comments. Uh, do we have final comments? Council Member Rallo. Thank you. Um, well, overall, I would say, um, well, my primary concern is the lack of recruitment. And uh, I realize that we're in competition with a lot of other municipalities. Uh, and um, also fewer people, I think, are going into policing for various reasons. but. Um, despite this, um, it seems that um, the incentives are probably not working as we had hoped. Uh, the base uh, salary has increased, um, and it's increasing at a healthy amount this year, it looks like. It will trend down in the coming years. Um, I wonder if we should refashion the incentives. Um, you know, we, we could have... Uh, Indianapolis offers, I think, $10,000 for um, an incentive to, to join. However, that doesn't really address um, the attrition of people leaving. Um, so I'm going to be passing this evening because I want to um, ruminate on whether adding non-sworn officers is really beneficial um, when we really should probably be directing those monies to some sort of incentive to bring that number up. So um, thank you for your presentation and, and all of your work uh, to, to you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. I too will be passing on this one. I have major concerns too in, in regard to our, our, short, our staff, staffing shortages and our um, need to maybe take a look at incentives that includes, and this is another one of my concerns, uh, the feasibility studies, the due diligence that are going on about the proper place for either a new police headquarters or a joint with police and fire. Um, so I'm going to hold off until I have a little more information about how that's going and uh, if I think that that could be, you know, something that could tip the scales in a much better direction. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to offer congratulations to um, Deputy Chief Odom on the promotion and Captain of Operations McWilliams. Um, also want to acknowledge our 
colleague and friend over here from dispatch who spent all this night here, so good to see you. Um, and also congratulations on the reaccreditation. Reaccreditation. I did say that right. Um, the Kalia re-up. Re so uh, very, very exciting. Um, I also would like to add that uh, I'm not so much going to repeat what I was telling Chief Moore because I think we all heard it loud and clear. Um, I think he, as far as with BPD, I probably had deep, deeper seated conversations in that regard than I have with BFD for a while. So um, I won't go into that this evening. Um, I'm also excited. I, I'll, I'm going to support this budget. I know we'll hear more before we do our final vote, um, but I'm excited. Um, I'm looking. We have some forward-thinking initiatives and plans, um, so I want to see where those go. Um, I also look to have uh, to look into deeper or further, not deeper, further reforms. Um, which, and I know it may not look like what some folks look, and we have done some of those, but I'd like to see how that manifests itself as well. Um, with regard to our um, police and fire recruiting specialists, um, I'm interested in, in seeing the results from that too. I mean, I'm excited about that as well. Um, maybe they could help us also figure out what fuels this trend of younger recruits to not work long term in a particular um, department or area. Um, I don't know if there's an answer, but I mean, I'd like to hear more about that. Um, and the incentives, uh, I think it's too early to tell whether they're the right incentives. They may not be. We may have to do more, but I think it's a bit early to tell because I think we were pretty aggressive with some of the things that we did. Um, to to kind of get to where we um, uh, uh, want to recruit people, good people, good officers. One of the things that I hope that this recruiting specialist will look into, and I served several years, I don't know, seven, eight years on the Board of Public Safety. I've always found that it was pretty darn easy to sell Bloomington Police Department, uh, for the most part. But that in many cases, it was more difficult to sell the city of <laughs> Bloomington than it was the, the, the police department. So I think it's, it's a combination of a lot of things when we're recruiting people. I mean, look, we got to think bigger than just BPD, okay, and particularly with some of our BIPOC recruits, in particularly, okay? So I, I just want to get that out there. Um, I know many of us understand that but I still want it at the forefront, at the top of these conversations um, as we move forward. And um, let me look through my notes, make sure I didn't forget anything. I think that's about it. Um, I will be voting yes tonight. I look to hear more details as we move forward to final uh, voting on, on this budget. Um, and we'll continue conversing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other final comments? I'd like to make a, a final comment and that <clears throat> I appreciate all the work that uh, BPD has done, um, uh, the leadership and everything. Uh, I think there's been a lot of really creative things amongst a real challenging last couple of years. So um, thank you for doing that and I'll be supporting the budget. All right, we ready for a due pass recommendation? Uh, Deputy Clerk Crosley, if you will call the roll. Mm -hmm. Councilor Scamberleary? Yes. Sandberg? Pass. Rollo? Pass. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Pass. Volan? Pass. And Sam's. Sam's. Yes. I'm sorry. I thought you said Sam's. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Let's see if I can count right today. Three zero five. I think it's four zero four. Oh, four zero four. Yeah. I went to IU. I, I can't count. Four zero four. Oh. Oh. Uh, 
So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation. And was there something else? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think we've concluded our business for these, this evening. Thank you all very much for all your help and all your work. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.